right. Hello, 14 us brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is July 11th, 2023, and we are counting them down. We are on the highest watch in all of human history of the, what, maybe, okay, all of human history, yes, but definitely 2,000 years. This is the highest watch of all time that we're coming to. You know it well. We're going to cover some things in, in relation to this point. You see, we know we're looking at this period right here. We've proved why biblically we've gone through it. We, we've broken it down. And when I say prove, I shouldn't say prove it, but we, we've revealed the connections to it, how and why, what it equals to 70 years, how we can get to 70 years. What does it mean for 70 to the Lord, which we're going to touch on a little bit more here again today just in in some in some quick points to say look i do not see it going beyond this year and i'm going to make the points to why it is something you guys know very well and i'm going to bring some clarity on some of the points we already knew that we thought were past but when we understand the count from taurus we know they're not past so i'm going to reiterate a couple things that connect directly to this seventh sabbath right here that makes this the beginning of the 50-day count. We're going to go into the Gospels. We're going to go into the, the three portions of the workers group for a reason which relates to the discourses of the three Gospels. And probably, depending what I give the title of this video, you'll know what I'm going to be getting at or you're going to understand what the purpose of that title is when we get to it. It's going to bring us to the end then of Revelation, uh, the end of tribulation. It's going to show the explanation of what we've revealed and now and have understood now for a while about the, the, the picture of the tribulation, the years of the tribulation to the Lord in the final year and, and how that relates to the wedding at the end. Not the Gentile wedding at the beginning, but we would say the, the Hebrew wedding at the end. But then I'm going to show you that there's still one more wedding. What? How on earth is there three weddings? Well, you're going to see when we get towards the end. But we're going to build it up all along the way and show that what it means that when these 50 days are over, at true Pentecost, as crazy as it seems on the last day of Elul, when you understand Taurus is the beginning, when you put the sickle to the corn, which is wheat, you will see and understand this is the beginning of the tribulation. Now, that doesn't mean when this starts and the pre-trib escape happens and the 50 days that come first, that doesn't mean it's not going to be tribulation. We know it's related to the seven-day wedding. We know it's related to the white horse rider, which is part of seals. However, we also know that at the anointing of the Holy Ghost, when peace is removed then from the earth, when the anointing of the Holy Ghost happens and the Holy Ghost is gone on the 50th day, then we know Jerusalem is attacked and destroyed. And that is the beginning of the red horse rider and it is the official quote unquote now <laughs> I, it, it's always hard to say right how do you say official yet not official if tens of millions of people vanished 50 days before well i would say that's pretty official you know what i'm saying but this is the beginning of the red horse rider and is the beginning of the 14 years not seven years like the world has shown but 14 years we have proven it from the beginning of, of revelation to the end of tribulation in dozens and dozens of places through the gospels all over the place it's right in our face but people always have to read through it because if you don't understand that the truth is 14 you have to read through those things to try to understand seven and how is it going to fit well clearly when you see those things revealed in scripture there's no way to wrap your head around it unless you understand the 14 years. So the 14 years begins at the Red Horse Rider, which will be at the Feast of Trumpets when Jerusalem is attacked. 
We've revealed how it's connected to the fifth and the seventh month on their calendar. Okay? On their calendar. The Lord God still has his count, which is to true Feast of Weeks, which on his count has always been from Taurus, which we're going to touch on again briefly. But what I'm going to do today, one of the key pieces and, and the reason for the title, as I believe that will be the title that, I, that I'm thinking about, is to prove that if it's there in Mark and it's there in Matthew, then guess what it means? It means it also begins the 14 years. Not the 50 days. That's, not, that's why it's not there in Luke. But the reason for it being there in Mark has nothing to do with the, the mid-trib or pre-trib rapture. It has nothing to do with, with uh, you know, people think there's pre, mid, and post, and that the post is a rapture. We know the post isn't a rapture. It's his return. But what do we know about that return? There's one more year. It's, it's the picture of the wedding, 13th and 14th year. Well, guess what? Every single one of them is connected to the title of this video, which is all about this day right here. The first to the second day of Tishri at the Feast of Trumpets. We're going to cover all this and more, and we're going to take you right to the end of the millennial reign, all the way from the beginning. Now, we're not going to go into the extreme details of all of it. Most of you, the vast majority, have been here long enough, have understood many of these things. So we're going to cover some of these things quickly. Then we're going to go into some details, and then we're going to highlight what happens at the end of the millennial reign. And I'm going to show you, it's not what a lot of people think it is. You know, why would, why would so many people go to Revelation 21 believing that it's uh, the bride of Christ, right? It's a bride, but it's not the Gentile bride. Look at when the story is. It's at the end of the millennial reign. But we'll get to that, all right? I digress a little bit there. So, um, you know what? Let me do as I always do. You know, before we get into this other stuff, because even though my computer is really spinning, I got a lot of stuff open and I want to remove two things as quickly as possible. I'm going to start by going to this so uh, so everybody knows. So anybody that's new to the ministry, there's two places you can go, which is right here in the Ministry Revealed playlist. And this one right here, the Revealed End Time Study Note series. The other place you can go is to the ministryrevealed.com website and go to the link in the description called menu uh, uh, sorry in the menu called um intro that is the same intro series or virtually the same as this one here now it's the same on all the key ones and some of the ones that uh, that continue through in here but the ones later down here are not all the same okay so the website has it has it more in order more complete more in depth if you will the way i, I wanted it laid out but these are the ones that are key right here. To anybody that's new to the ministry, this 22-minute intro, if you just spend 22 minutes watching this video, you'll get the overview of, of the foundation that was revealed through this ministry. And it begins with the revelation of this 30 minutes. So in this one is about this, is a, is a brief talk on this one, a brief talk on this one, and a brief talk on this one. And what it's about is who the Gospels are speaking to. When you realize that the Gospels are truly speaking to three different groups of people in the Synoptic Gospels, John stands on his own revealing the end of days within his words. You're going to see that Matthew, Mark, and Luke in the end of days is Luke, Mark, and Matthew. You're going to understand why these differences within the Gospels, within stories, sometimes have people scratching their head. You know, we'll talk on one because it's going to be part of our story as we go further in tonight. But there's one about the transfiguration, right? When you go to uh, Luke, it says about in eight days. When you go to Mark, it says after six days. And in Matthew, it says after six days. That is definitely a crystal clear contradiction when you get to Luke. Well, what was the purpose? What you're going to begin to understand as we touch on it in the intro here, when you come into this 30-minute Bible study, which again is still just the beginning, 
you're going to realize that these differences within the Synoptic Gospels, they are all about prophecy. And it is going to blow your mind. You're going to realize that these differences within the Gospels, all of the differences within the discourses, it's all prophetic. Of course, the discourses are, but all of the rest is prophetic as well. And if prophetic, which it is, then that means, what is Luke's portion talking to? What is Mark's portion in his discourse talking to? What is Matthew's discourse and his portion talking to? When you, once you begin to understand that, you're going to realize the truth to the end of days is 14 years and a portion that Paul calls above 14 years in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. It's going to blow your mind because you're going to say, well, that's crazy talk. How, how could it be 14 years? Why didn't we ever know it? Well, first of all, it was hidden for the end of days. And in one sense, we are in the end of days. In, in an actual, literal sense, we are in the end of days. But we're not yet in the tribulation as the world is expecting end of days, like, in, like that the church understands in the end of days. But we are in them because the big picture of the end of days is 22 years. It is 777 and the final jubilee. It's the picture of creation, which we're going to talk on a little bit as we get towards the end to show you another point that just like the creation story, there's the revelation that we've shown here that it was a short period of time that flew by like days in the gap theory. That is actually 7,000 years if we were there in time. But to the Lord, it was seven days. Then you have the creation of days. Well, to the Father, to the Lord, they were there in days. But if we were there in time in the flesh, it would have been 7,000 more years. And then from Adam, we're living in time and we're in the dispensation of 7,000 years. But to the Lord, they're days. So you have seven, 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 seven days, seven days, seven days to the Lord, 7,000, 7,000, 7,000 to us if we were there in all of them in the dimension of time, in the flesh seeing it all, it would have been 21,000. And then you've got the final 22nd, which is the beginning of eternity. It is the new heaven and the new earth and the beginning of eternity. Well, it's the same thing. How in the end of days, as you're going to see as we get into this, anybody that's newer, you're going to see that the, the first portion of seven years that I'm saying, look, we are in the end of days, but we're not in the tribulation portion. We are in the setting up portion, the first seven, which is coming to the end in what I was telling you about earlier, that portion is like Jacob's seven years for Leah that flew by like days. He was expecting Rachel, but got Leah. That's the, the creation gap theory portion that is really 7,000 years or was seven days to the Lord, but it flew by and it's only two verses because he was so excited to create. And in the end of days, what that relates to is the seven that we're in right now, but they're going to seem like only days in the sense that what? There is a 50 day and above 14 years that Paul talks about. And that revelation is the Hebrew fifth month attack and seventh month day one attack. That is the revelation of the end of days. And you're going to see throughout these videos and throughout teachings, if you're newer, how it all plays out in the above and the 14 years that you're going to see today with another confirmation, guys, something we talked about a long time ago, but now is applicable like crazy because of the revelation we have. You're going to see that it must begin at trumpets when you see where it ends every other time. It's awesome. All right. So this is where you're going to begin to get an intro in this 30 minute Bible study. You're going to begin to understand the 14 years. This one, it's all because of Matthew. This is when you're going to realize how on earth was this missed? How did we miss the first seven years and only see the, sev the last seven years that we call trumpets? How did we miss the first seven years being separate for seals? The answer is we have all been taught for hundreds and hundreds of years 
from the foundation gospel of Matthew because it was never understood who the gospels were speaking to. We never understood that Mark was the one speaking to, quote unquote, the world, the, the house of Israel with the Gentiles grafted in, right? The, the, the Gentile, uh, the Israel is not in the land of Israel right now. Judah is in the land right now, okay? That's because, as we all know, the 10 tribes scattered throughout the earth and they're mixed in with all the Gentiles everywhere. But Judah is the one in the land right now. All right. That's Matthew's portion. And what everybody has missed, because everything unknowingly to everybody comes from a perspective of Matthew, they barely look to Mark and they look even less to Luke. It's going to blow your mind. And this is a big teaching, but every moment of it will be worth your time, I promise. And then you're going to see things that reveal pre, mid, and post. You're going to understand why there's been an argument among churches for centuries about pre, mid, and post. Even today, what's true, pre, mid, or post? And those that want to argue with you and say, <clears throat> no, it's post, it's post, and they go to Matthew, well, guess what? They're right. They're right. It is when the Lord returns post in Matthew's discourse. You see? Mid is actually the end of Mark's discourse, and pre is Luke's discourse. That's why Luke in 2136 says, watch and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass. And he's relating to Luke. So what was Matthew, Mark, Luke, the way people read the Bible? The first will be last. The last will be first. In the end of days, it goes Luke, Mark, Matthew. Above 14 years to the first seven of 14 to the second seven of 14. Here you're going to see those discourses revealed. All of these things. I mean, it's incredible. The seven churches, uh, Daniel 9, the mystery of the comma, and I promise you these are worth your time but it's imperative, start with these four videos right here, all right? I promise you, you're gonna, you're gonna be blown away just as we have all been here in this ministry, all right? So with that, I do wanna make the announcement. Uh, I, I've told you guys about it already. This is uh, tribulation-now.org. So I don't know how you guys would be able to see the, uh, the blog, uh, but we're doing maybe right here. There you go. So tomorrow at uh, six from six to seven p.m. Mountain Standard Time, which is eight to nine p.m. Eastern Standard Time, I'm going to be on here uh, talking about the pre, mid, and post, and revealing it through the Gospels, touching on the 14 years. I've got about an hour, and then I don't know how much longer, maybe an hour, two hours longer. Uh, it turns out it's not call-ins, uh, but people email them during the show. Uh, with some questions. So we'll see how long the question period goes and so forth. But I wanted to share that with you guys. And for anybody um, that's in the forum, <coughs> or if people, when they hear me talk about the forum, you can come to the website right here. And in the menu, you'll see forum. You can click on it. Join us in the forum for free. There's uh, oh, getting close to 1,200 people, 1,150 people worldwide uh, in the forum signed up many more active than others. And we're sharing news and events and prayer requests and, and, and all sorts of things. And you can join it for free. It takes you a few seconds to sign up if you wanna come join us. Um, this is the forum right here. So you can see all sorts of articles, uh, encouragement, things that people are posting. You know, very, very exciting. And I wanted to share this one because this is our the, the ministry that we support with our brother Steve and his team in Uganda. I think Steve is right here looking down. Um, there's one of his, uh, one of the brothers that support and that do the teachings with them. Uh, there's Steve right here. And this was the event that they had. It's incredible. And I just wanted to spend a moment sharing it with you because he did a video on his YouTube channel. And I don't remember the name of it offhand. And uh, he shared about it, he shared it in the forum. And it was incredible. You guys, you know, in the Western world, we we forget, you know, not even forget. I mean, I, I should say forget. We forget what it's like in other parts of the world where they don't have things as convenient as we do. 
some of these people, they traveled. So he was expecting, I think it was close to 450 people going to this area and going to this this big uh, uh, um, uh, mission that they were doing. And he was expecting that there was about 50 something churches from different areas that we're gonna greet, that we're gonna uh, meet up here, but they were gonna be the, the leaders in the church. And they were gonna be teaching, yes, on salvation and all these things, but they were also gonna be teaching what we reveal here in the ministry. They teach on the end of days and, and the revelation of the gospels to be able to understand them and to be prepared for what's to come. And what happened is people from these churches all over the place in Uganda started hearing about it. And people, he had said, walked 60 miles. Did you hear that? They walked 60 miles, some of these people, to come and listen. How's that? He said it was too many people. Look at how many people are in the room. He said it got so packed in there because they weren't expecting those people. So they went out into a field, they, they were out in the field doing the preaching, and then they had to find shelter for everybody. My goodness, he talked about a 101-year-old lady who has been in Christ for a long time, and she's telling him, I feel it, the Lord is coming, we are so close. I mean, it was so encouraging. So many people came up, and I don't have the picture of it here, but so many people came up and gave their lives to Christ. This is what we support, brothers and sisters. Here in this ministry is the revelation. Our focus is the revelation of Jesus Christ. I don't know why us, I don't know why through the ministry, but it is 100% fact that it's happening and we have proven it throughout hundreds of videos. Revelation after revelation, connecting from Genesis to the end of Revelation all the way through. That is the mission here. But it's not the only mission. We are proud to support. We are honored, I should say. I don't like that word proud. We are honored to support Steve and his team in that mission that they have over in Uganda. Bringing salvation, bringing Christ to the masses there. Teaching about the revelation of the end to prepare the people and help them better understand his word. To, to feed the poor, clothe them, right? doing all sorts of things. This is what we have a part in supporting. Steve and his team being our hands and feet in Uganda. It's absolutely beautiful. I love it. I'm always excited to hear about his reports. I wish we always had the ability to send thousands of dollars every month and every week. I would love it. I know we can't do that, unfortunately, right? But those that can, please keep doing so. I know many of you do, and I am grateful. Please keep doing it. And those that are contemplating that can again, please do it again. You can do it right here with our GoFundMe or PayPal right here, or from our website or in links under the video as well. All right. So now let's, let's get started with this portion of where we are. And, and this count that we know and understand in relation to that began from Taurus, okay? It's, it's not gonna be a long piece here, but I wanna remind everybody. You see, when the Lord in Genesis chapter 12, wait, where am I? Oh yeah, yeah, sorry, before I get there, oh, I'm so glad I, I kept this, uh, I had this in order just in case, right? I almost missed it again. So in the last live show, by the way, anybody that hadn't seen the live show, it doesn't show up under videos, it shows up under live. This was the last video uh, we did, right? In the usual time frame, And uh, it was awesome. We covered some great stuff in there on AI and this interview that had taken place with, uh, with people that were, th that, uh, with a guy that was there in the beginning with Google with it. Really, really fascinating stuff. And, and another incredible marker proving the season and time that we're in. And um, while I was doing it, before we went live, I was telling one of our sisters, Deborah, that, that okay, you know what, I'll set it up, I'll get talking, and then you can ask your question uh, about what you wanted to share or, or, or share what you wanted to share. And 
as I got going and I was building it, we had a question, but it didn't come from her. And I went into that question and I totally forgot. So this is a piece that our sister Deborah wanted to share and on the live show. And we had touched on one piece of it in a recent video. And it was it was the the the, the story of 75 years. And we showed how with uh, Abraham being 75 years old, we know that Abraham, you know, when he was 75 years old, the Lord said, OK, you know, he would make his way to Canaan and he would see Canaan. Right. So a lot of people are pointing to it to say, see, 75 years when Israel came into the land and you do the count and and it's 75 years. So it's another thing pointing to this season and time. And when we go to um, when we go to Abraham, we know the story in the typology of Abraham being like Matthew, Nahor like Mark and Haran like Luke. And Abraham, of course, relating to Judah, right? To the Jews, we've shared on this in the past. And so the fact that he was 75, and we know 75 years in the land, right? The five-year count that we share, and then the 70, some people are looking at that and saying, see, here's another count that we have showing us to 70. Well, she had also shared, so that's something we touched on in the past with this one, but she was also sharing that in Acts, in Acts chapter 7, there's a very interesting piece as well, in that um, in Acts chapter 7, starting in verse 14, then sent Joseph and called his father Jacob to him, to him and all his kindred, 75 souls. So you have another count of 75, and it says, so Jacob went down to Egypt and died, he and our fathers, and were carried over into Shechem or Sishem, okay? So again, you've got 75 and being carried over. There was another point that was made as well, which related that she had shared um, in Luke chapter three. In Luke chapter three, we know the count for the generations, okay? From, again, father being Joseph, right? And you've got this count and there's what? 75 listed. So there's people that are looking at this and saying, look, there's some there's some serious connections that we have to 75 years, an account of 75 people in 75 here and 75 there. And so that was just something that she wanted to add to the storyline of this being the time of 75. So I didn't want to forget that. I wanted to make sure to remember to get that in. But there's one thing with this. I, this is this is another thing to point to and to say, oh, there's another connection building on top of all of this. However, the, the biggest point is still really what? 70 years, right? We know that everything is related to 70. So the 70 is definitely the more important because it's all throughout scripture as the years and the land and how to count it and everything else. But the 75 is another added piece so on top of all of these things that we've covered and things that we're going to show again today and build on you're going to see that yet again adding to the 70 and proving out the 70 as we have adding that it's the 75th adding the thing of understanding trumpets adding what's going on in the world adding how how terrifyingly close it is within months for AI and the things taking place. It's building on, building on, building on. All showing us this season and time that we're in. And Psalms 90 and 10 is our greatest reminder. Along with many other places you know of. But the reminder of 70 years. You see, I don't know of any other ministry and it's not being boastful or proudful what it is is because they're now 75 you see because it's 75 when people come to psalms 90 and 10 and go 70 to 80 they say see 70 to 80 as if it could be somewhere in there it'll begin somewhere between 70 and 80. well that's not at all what it says there's no break between 70 and 80. It says 
the days of our years are 70, and if by reason of strength, they're 80. So the days of our years are 70. And if you can make it to 80, that strength is labor and sorrow, which means tribulation, travail, vexing, uh, uh, pain. You see, it means tribulation. So it means from 70 to 80 is tribulation. And then, as you all know, soon cut off is just like Daniel, right? After the three score and 10, the about three and a half years, which is the about mid trumpet. So this takes you to what? 10 years plus about half a year. That's about 10 and a half years. And we fly away. We all know this is the one from Revelation chapter 12, 14, which is mid trumpets when they fly away until the end of the 14 years and are brought back for the final jubilee when they will all have their debts forgiven and they all receive their portion of land like Ezekiel 40, uh, 48, okay? So there is no, you, you can't take 70 to 80 and just pick, a, pick one of the years in between, you see? And that's a little bit of what happens with people with 75. But when you add the understanding and the revelation of that understanding of 70 coming to an end, then everything changes. You see, and here's what I want to begin to remind you guys of. 70 to 80, we've talked on this in the past. 70 to 80, I do have it here, okay? Israel's timepiece. 70 to 80, right there. What does that mean, 70 to 80? Does that mean 11 years? No, it means 10. So what does that mean? It means when 70 is finished. This is so important to know because you're going to understand we can't go to 71, 72, 70. You can't, you can't. It has to end when 70 years are complete. It will all begin. Now the father has his date when that portion will start and the tribulation of the 14 is their start. Hello. You see? So let's, we're going to cover that. We're going to talk about those two differences as well. But this is important to understand because this is something we've shared on many, many times. When somebody <clears throat> has their 70th birthday party, most people think 70 years is just beginning. Their 70th year, but it's not true. It's completed. And what happens? Now they've begun their 71st year. And at their birthday, they have completed 71 years. That's why it's not 11 years, it's 10 years. Because when you say from 70 to 80, you don't say 70, 71, 72, and then go to 80, that would be 11 years. Nobody does that. When somebody tells you 70 to 80 or 10 to 20, you say 11, 12, or you say 71, 72. That's exactly what it is. And it begins the moment after 70 years are complete. There it is right there. There's your 10 years. You're going from about what? Summertime, late summer, 2023, right? To the end of summer, 2033. You've got your about, which is from summer into winter, about six months. And then you've got from your about six months, the we fly away. There it is right there. Winter of 33 through summer of 34, right? There's your remaining about six months, the other half of it. And then you've got your two and a half years to the end of 13 years. And then you've got your final 14th year coming to an end. You have to understand, it, doesn't, it cannot begin at 71. That's, what, that's, what, um, that's why Psalms 90 and 10 is so important. It really helped us clarify and understand that it is not from 71. There is no turning 71 and then it starts. Because at the turning of 71, 71 is complete. It is at the completing of 70. And so how do we get to that completing of 70? Well, all you guys know what it is in relation to the house of Judah. It is the house of Judah. You see, this is where they change their calendar year. On Tishri 1, the calendar changes, 5784. What was it before? 5783. To the house of Judah, their year begins right here. Who's in the land, remember? Judah, of course. 
Judah is in the land. We know how the count came to be, those who have been around for a while or even, even a little bit. We have understood how to count this from Leviticus 19. We don't need to go into the entire count of Leviticus 19. But I want to show you guys something, you see? When 70 is completed, how did 70 end up being this year? It ended up being this year when we understood how to properly count in Leviticus. In Leviticus 19, when you come into the land, plant all manner of trees, okay? You come into the land first, then you need to plant all manner of trees, okay? And then what? Well, now you're, 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 you haven't started your official year yet because you needed to plant trees while you were in it. But the house of Judah doesn't start their year till trumpets. And the house of Judah does a session, which means those months from planting the trees, from when they came into the land, planted the trees, got their government, they don't officially start counting their year until Tishri 1, which means it didn't start until 1948 to 1949. That was when they first came into the land, planted all manner of trees. And then from Tishri of 1949 to Tishri of 1950. To the Lord God, it's to his true Feast of Weeks, which we're going to cover. And to the Jews, it's Tishri. So it was 1949 to 1950. That was year one complete. Year two, 50 to 51, 51 to 52. That was three years complete of which they planted fruit here, the trees here, and they observed first year there. They observed the second year of planting of trees complete there and the third year complete here. Okay, three years. They could not take from it. It wasn't theirs. It was to be, it was uncircumcised, right? In the fourth year. So in their fourth year, it was also the fourth year that the trees had completed their fourth year. So it's completed the fourth year of the trees in their fourth year. That was the revelation that it never began in 1948. That was the revelation, was the word in. And then what does it say? The fifth year forward is now yours. So what did that mean? From 1953 to 1954, Tishri to Tishri for the house of Judah, the Jews who are in the land, the count began. And of course, where did that bring us? Hello. Tishri to Tishri, 2022 to 2023, for the house of Judah, 70 years comes to an end. Hello. So what else does it show us? Without going into everything, because I know we've covered this before, what else did we understand? We understood that when they came and captured the rest of Jerusalem in 1967, it also ended up starting on a new Shemitah cycle just like it so happened to start on a new Shemitah cycle at their fifth year, in the fifth year from when they came in and did what they were supposed to according to Leviticus, it just so happened to be a new Shemitah cycle. Do you understand it must be a Shemitah cycle? It must be because for 70 years to end, that would be 10 sevens. How about Jerusalem? Look at that. It ended up being a new Shemitah cycle. Why does it have to be? Because at the end of that 70, it has to be what? 10 sevens. So when they came into the land, they had that count for Leviticus. Jerusalem, they already had Jerusalem. They just got the rest of it. They had already been in the land. They were already planting in Jerusalem, in the south of the plain and throughout Israel. That was for when they came into the land. This was from when they captured. And there's how many years left? 14. How did we come to this count? We knew that there were two seven years left. There was one that began, right? Remember the whole picture is 21 and the final is what? The big picture, 22 years. You see? So what we did is we count seven years all the way back, seven, 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 all the way back to Christ. And guess what happened? Everything on this chart is perfectly in order to the death and resurrection of Christ to when Christ began to be 30, to the sun, moon, and stars that revealed 
the birth of Christ. There's a reason why I'm showing you this. Because I know we've covered it a number of times. Do you know that if we had to go one more year, there would only be 13 years between this Israel. See, it would only be 13 years between these two if we had to subtract one year from this total. What else would it be? It would mean 71. It would mean 71 years has to be complete before the tribulation can begin. But it would only leave 13 years to the end of Jerusalem. And they're 70. It would mean Psalms 90 and 10, 70 to 80 is what? 11 years? No, it can't be. It would have to equal nine. Well, that's impossible. It's 70 to 80. Then short time, then three and a half years of Revelation 12, uh, 12, 14. So right off the bat, there's an issue here according to scripture. Well, guess what else happens? If all this has to move up one year, guess what else happens? Jerusalem isn't captured on a Shemitah cycle. How can it not start on a Shemitah cycle, have seven cycle, uh, 10 cycles, and have to end on a Shemitah cycle? What about when they came into the land? We have clearly revealed the understanding of Leviticus 19. If we've already not counted 1948 to 1949 because of what had to be done, we've accounted for them not being the house of Israel, but the house of Judah. And meaning the count didn't begin until Tishri of 1949, year one, year two, year three, the fourth year to the Lord, and then the fifth year theirs. If we added one more year, where would we be? We'd be 54 to 55. There is no sixth year. You cannot get away from the fact that they came into the land in 1948. You can't get away from the fact that when they came into the land and planted all manner of trees in February of 1949, you can't get away from that. You can't get away from the fact that scripture told us what they would have to do and how the counts would be when they came into the land. So what would it mean if we had to add one more year? You see, it's not simply a matter of moving the, the, the 14 years higher and everything else would still fall in place. It doesn't. It doesn't. Because there is a foundation here from when they came into the land of 1948. There is a biblical revelation in Leviticus that tells us how to count it. One more year, it's no longer there. What else? What about the death and resurrection of Christ? You realize if we go one more year, then the count would go into 2034. Remember, this is the, the typology. You can say feast of weeks, feast of weeks. Or if you want to go from, from where we are, saying uh, Tishri to Tishri. That's the 2034. That's Tishri, feast of weeks, or Tishri 2033 to, uh, sorry, 33 AD to 34 AD. That would mean his death and resurrection would have been in 34 AD. You see? Because this is where the Passover portion would have been, right here. Do you realize there is no events in recorded history for the sun, moon, and stars of events happening in 34 AD? It's in 33. Do you realize what we revealed in Luke chapter 3, when Jesus began to be about 30. You see, when Jesus began to be about 30, we know it's after he completed his 29th birthday. And when you begin to be 30 is the day after you've completed your 29th and you had your birthday celebration, had cake and everything. The following day, you have begun your 30th year. What happens if it goes one more? Then the revelation of Luke 3, Jesus beginning to be about 30, 
would be Jesus beginning to be about 31. You understand why this is important, right? I was so blown away when I got this one. When the Spirit leads as He always does, when this one came to be, it was the final piece in the picture of this entire chart. It was the one question I still had to the Lord, and I received it. What's the answer to that? What is the answer to that one? I'm going to remind you what it is. It's this right here. 70 to 80. 70 to 80. It's the same storyline. The 70 to 80 is the exact same thing as this. 70 is done. 70 is done. And the very next day starts the 71st. Just like when the 29 is done, the very next day you start your 30th. If this is wrong and it's one more year, well, then guess what? Then 70 is wrong. But if 70 is wrong, then the revelation of Leviticus is wrong. But you understand how it can't be because they actually came into the land in 1948. Do you realize this can't be because his death and resurrection was 33? You realize this can't be because, or, or the following one, this can't be because this is the revelation of Luke chapter 3. It confirms the same thing as Psalms 90 and 10 for 70. What else does it do? Guess what? How about Jesus' birth? There are videos everywhere. We've showed a couple different ones, that planetarium and that other guy that goes around. They've been traveling for years showing the birth of Christ revealed in the sun, moon, and stars. Do you know when it was? To those using the Gregorian, they would say it was 2 BC. But in the truth, when you're using sun, moon, and stars, there is a year zero. So it's 1 BC. Do you know that if all of this had to move by one more year? We would have no choice but to say Jesus must have been born in year zero. Do you know to, to say Jesus was born in year zero, you know what happens? There's no more events in the sun, moon, and stars. All that these people have traveled around revealing to hundreds of thousands and millions of people all over the world for decades in the revelation of the star of Bethlehem and everything that was revealed in it, it would be one year off. Well, you realize that's impossible, right? He was in the sun, moon, and stars. We can't make it one more year. It's when he began to be 30, not 31. You can't make it one more year. It was 33 AD, not 34 AD. We can't make it one more year. They came into the land in 1948. We can't make them say, oh, it was actually 1949. Leviticus reveals it. We can't say, sorry, Leviticus, you, you have to add one more year. What does it all mean? It means be ready and watching always, brothers and sisters. Because one more year, and everything I have gone through and reviewed for myself and studied and gone into, there is not one more year. It is in, in my study of everything, myself, not a thus saith the Lord. There is no possibility of one more year or two or seven or 14. You understand what that means, right? Does it mean we all go crazy, everybody quit your jobs and everything? No. That's probably why the Lord hasn't told us, right? This is not a thus saith the Lord. There are no dreams, visions, words from the Lord. It is the revelation of his word that we have talked about happening here for the last almost six years. Proven 
video after video after video. A little coffee. So get excited. Be be a little bit conservative in your excitement because it's not a thus saith the Lord. But I can tell you this. This is the greatest watch revelation piece by piece understood that has ever happened in human history. To the greatest of man's ability by the leading and revelation of the Holy Ghost in the word. Not me. As you've always heard me say in the past, I am nothing but the mouthpiece. How about this? This is what I was getting at earlier in relation to Exodus. Okay? In the Exodus story, in chapter 12, what did the Father tell Moses? In verse 2, this month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. We all know what it meant. We all know when this happened in the sun, moon, and stars. Do you understand with this whole count of Shemitahs going all the way back to the birth of Christ and it landing at the time of his birth and we get it in the sun, moon, and stars? You see what happened here? In the sun, moon, and stars, as you've heard me say a number of times recently, Moses looked up and he saw it was Taurus when the Lord told him, this is the beginning of your months. Do you know it's the only place in Scripture where the Lord told him that? Okay. Not only the beginning of your months, but the first month of the year. He told him in other places, this is the first month and so forth. It's the only place where he says, the first month of the year. Did the Lord account for the sun going off course by two months and being two months sooner? Yes. The feast, the harvest, everything lines up with it. He knew it was. But in the end, it still never changed the fact that Taurus is to the Father the first month of the year. It's awesome. What is the first month of the year? You guys all know it. It's Taurus. We all know to the Hebrew, uh, to the early Hebrews, Taurus was the first constellation in the Zodiac. Consequently, it represented the first letter of their alphabet. And it just so happens what? The first letter of their alphabet is 22 letters. Seven easy. Seven seals, seven trumpets, new beginning, final jubilee. You understand that? The jubilee, see all the Shemitah, seven, 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 seven. This, this final seven is the 49th year, and there's your final jubilee. That, that's why the revelation of the end is the revelation also of the big picture of everything. The whole story is all about 22. It represents the new beginning. Okay? You'll see. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more on some of this as well. So we know it all began in Taurus. So not only was it the one place where the Lord told Moses, I'm going to close this off, where the Lord told Moses, this is the beginning of your years. We also know from Genesis 1. In the beginning, we know this is Christ, feast of first fruits, right? Without leaven, that means Christ. So in Christ, God created, <coughs> excuse me, the heaven and the earth. What was the beginning? Taurus. Taurus. You see, what, what, what was it? It was feast of first fruits, which is the 16th day of the first month. When was the resurrection? 16th day of the first month. So if we took the 16th day of the first month being Taurus and did the count, what did we end up with? Of course, the count that we've been talking about for a while now. That's your resurrection. And now you begin to count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven Sabbaths, 
and then 50 days. And it just so happened to be the fifth month fasting and mourning and the seventh month to the fasting and mourning of Gedalia because of the attack that took place, one on the ninth, one on the first of Tishri. It's, it's, all, it's all here, guys. Every single part and piece of this. It, everything. Look at what it also makes of. Okay, Savan becomes month one, Tammuz becomes month two, and what does Av become? Month three. When does the Lord return? After the seventh on the eighth day. What is it a picture of? Sixteenth day, right? Fifteenth to the sixteenth day, third month. When was Christ born? There's the picture of it right there. The fifteenth day of the third month. And we're looking for a connection to the 40 days of the Son of Man beginning. And in the revelation of it, we got the revelation that it was what? Approximately two months from when Isaiah 9 took place, right? From, where is it? We know that it all related to the Isaiah 9 from Matthew chapter 4. When John went into prison, that's when Jesus came walking through as this one child born unto us. It means it was two months. So if we go from Christ's birthday, which was the third month, right here, and two months later, puts us right here. But in the picture of Savan being month one to the father, Tammuz being month two, and Av being month three, what do we have? The birth of Christ and the start of his 40 days. It's insanity. We, we can't make these things up. It's impossible to be this creative to make this kind of stuff up and to be able to back it and support it by scripture after scripture after scripture. So we had Taurus, when the father told him beginning in your months. We know in the beginning it was Taurus. What else do we know? Well, what about the pendant, right? Do you realize none of these things changed, guys? None of these things have changed. The pendant that Christ was wearing, that had this on it, which is ayin means 70, aleph means one, Taurus, and nun means uh, uh, 50. It's the 14th letter of the Hebrew alphabet. 16th letter of the Hebrew alphabet means 70, means 50, and aleph is one, the beginning. Do you realize none of this changes? Do you realize none of it changes? You want to know why? Because to the Father, this is the third month. What, what's the Feast of Weeks? To the Father, this is the time of the Feast of Weeks. This, this is the time of the new wine. And we've shared how both of these things for hundreds of years from here to here the leavened bro bread loaves were brought to the church i was talking um uh, uh in in um email with our brother jake and he lives in southern ontario in canada a few provinces over from me and he was saying that the wheat harvest they're just starting to get to the wheat harvest huh how fitting isn't it how fitting. Of course they're just getting to the weed harvest because that's actually when it happens. There's that difference as we've been sharing forever, winter wheat and spring wheat. It is the difference between the mid-trib group and the post-trib group. Of course it's being harvested late July. It, they'll tell you late spring or into summer. It can be very late spring, but it's generally most, I'd say almost 99 plus percent of the time is in the earlier to middish type summer. That's exactly right. Because of what? This is actually true Feast of Weeks. That's the true Feast of Weeks. Remember this? How about this one? In the Book of Jubilees, Israel rolled from Iran and the new moon in the third month, and it came to pass 
uh, by the way of the well of oath, this is from the Book of Jubilees, uh, the well of oath, so in the third month, and offered a sacrifice to God his father Isaac on the seventh of the month. Okay, we're talking about the eighth. But in fact, if you look at the moon cycle, it might be one day earlier, just so you guys are aware. And Jacob remembered the dream which he had dreamed at Bethel and feared and, uh, and feared to descend down to Egypt. And while he was thinking uh, that he would send word to Joseph that he should come to him and that he would not go down, he remained seven days. If he might see a vision, whether he should remain or go down. And look at what it says. And he celebrated the festival of first fruits with old grain. When did he do it? While he was contemplating during these seven days whether he should go down. And when those seven days, when that period of time was up, what do you get? On the 16th day, the Lord appeared to him. Whoops. On the 16th, oh, I hit a button by mistake. On the 16th day, the Lord appeared to him. The 16th day of the third month. What are we talking about? 16th day of the third, third month. To who? To the Lord God. This is the period of the first fruits of the wheat. This is the period of bringing in the two loaves of bread with leaven. Right? We've shared on this a number of times recently. And so even in relation to the pendant, what does it relate to? From the count of Taurus, right? Seven Sabbaths, begin your 50 days. So what do we have to the Father? This is the end. This is the end of 70 years to the Father, which is the Feast of Weeks. Then you have your 50 days, and your 50 days end on the 29th of Elul. And then you have what? The end, this is the end of 70 to Jerusalem, to, to the Jews, and the beginning of their year. This is the day one of 71. And it just so happens, Zechariah told us the fifth and seventh. That they observed them for 70 years. They're still in the land and then boom, there's a light affliction on the first one. Then bang, there's a second attack that destroys them. They did it for 70 years and sayonara. That's why 70 is so important. That's why we continue to dig in to the revelation of 70 years for five, five and a half, six years. Everything was based on the 70th year. Remember Deuteronomy? Deuteronomy 16, the three feasts of the Lord, which equals seven days, one day, and seven days. We know the revelation of it. It starts with the Feast of Weeks. What did it tell us? Seven weeks shall thou, num shall thou number unto thee, beginning to number the seven weeks from such time as thou beginnest to put the sickle to the corn. I'm sorry, this is not when they begin to put the sickle all the way back in April for the first fruits of barley. Do you realize this? The Feast of Weeks is the first fruits of the wheat harvest. It's all throughout Scripture. It's the Feast of Weeks. This word for corn, it could be translated grain or longer grain, but as we showed in previous videos, it's wheat. It's wheat, just like it was showing in all these other places in Scripture. It's the only way you can go from Passover all the way back where it is and still end up where the world has been showing us the, the whole thing with uh, Loafmas Day, right? Late July to the very beginning of August and new wine in the second to third week of September every year. And these things were happening for hundreds of years. We covered Isaiah 9, that, that whole revelation of two months. That was another mind blower.
I was telling you guys how excited I was at the revelation of finally being able to complete this understanding of what it meant when Jesus began to be 30. But then the most recent one that just blew me out of the water was this one right here. When we had been seeking to understand that it had to be at Jesus's birthday that the 40 days of the Son of Man as White Horse Rider begins, turns out it was two months later. You want to talk about a, an exciting, joyous revelation that was also frustrating? You understand why it was frustrating? Because it, it said, for unto us a child is born, a son is given. It sounds like they're rejoicing at his birth. Yet Matthew chapter 4 revealed to us that not only was it at his birth, like he was just being born, he was already he had already celebrated his 29th birthday and was about in his third he was in his 30th year about a couple months into it so talk about frustrating but man what a revelation to understand because just as we know it's going to come between a light affliction 40 days of the son of man and the 50th day serious syria comes and in one day bam jerusalem's destroyed these things we know, <clears throat> right? We know the relation to the 70 years when Jerusalem has their 70 done and then he brings the destruction and we know it's as grapes because again, it's the grape harvest at the end of Jerusalem's 70 years. And there's what, 14 years between them. People always say, oh, 70 years. Well, it's seven Sabbath, uh, seven, what does it say? 70 weeks. Well, look in Daniel 9, verse 2. It says, when he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Accomplish 70 in the desolations. Well, from the end of this year to the end of Jerusalem being 70 is 14 years. Man, it just keeps building, guys, doesn't it? It just keeps proving it over and over and over again. Now, how about this? When we were sharing this, right? You're going to see this as we go a little bit further and we go into the real big picture towards the end and see that final wedding. This is what we were talking about earlier. This is why I was saying we are in the quote unquote end of days these these first seven years that are coming to an end are the same typology of years from in the beginning that flew by right because there's only two verses they're really seven thousand years or they're really seven days to the lord they're really seven years to the end of days but we only get two verses in the in the beginning genesis chapter 1 verse 1 and 2. we've revealed the understanding of that gap theory creation we know what it is we know what the timing is but why were we only given two verses i've always submitted that it's because the lord was what so excited to go and create the father gave it to him right in the beginning so in christ god created jesus created it all because he was given it by the Father and he said, go to it, son. That's why Jesus is the creator of everything. It was all given to him. And he was so excited that it flew by. And so what do we get in the typology? We only get two verses. Well, what's the other picture we get? The other picture we get, you guys all know, and I'm doing this to, to show and, and let people that might be newer understand these things. That the seven years, he thought Jacob in chapter 29 of Genesis, starting in verse 20, when Jacob thought he was working seven years for Rachel, he served seven years for Rachel. They seemed unto him, but what? But a few days for the love that he had for her. Hello. When are those seven years? done 
according to the completed revelation of this Shemitah year count, it ends this year. And to the Father, it's going to be at the Feast of Weeks. It's this portion above 14 years. You see, it is a portion of seven years, just like it was for Jacob, just like it was in the first creation. But he said they flew by like days. The first creation story only has two verses because it flew by. In the same typology of Jacob's excitement, it seemed to have just flown by. These last seven years, even though they weren't easy for everybody, guess what? Compared to what's coming, these flew by. And, and what is the representation of all of it? Why a couple verses to give that entire picture? Why does Jacob say they, they only seemed as days because of the love that he had for her? You guys know the answer, right? 2 Corinthians chapter 12. What is the portion that is above 14 years in 2 Corinthians chapter 12? It's the 50 days. Not kind of, not maybe. We've understood it. It's the 50 days. And then so knowing this, for those that are newer, and going now to the story of Jacob and his father and seeing how long Jacob worked for his father-in-law, we go to Genesis 31, 41, and it says, Thus have I been 20 years in thy house. Okay. 20 years is representing what? It's from the beginning of the very first seven starting. Where's the 20 years? Bang, right there. Okay, there's your 20 years with your seven easy and then a flew by like days representation of the last 50 days before the next seven starts. And then 13 years. So you got seven, seven, and six. There's 20 years. There's your typology. <clears throat> of Jacob saying he served 20 years. He's saying, I served 14 for your two daughters, right? So he served 14 years for which the first seven, he ended up hoping for Rachel, expected Rachel, but got Leah, the one he didn't really want, right? These are the ones spirit-filled. It doesn't mean he doesn't want us. It's simply a typology because when Jesus came, He's not, he's not coming to save those who are spirit-filled. They're about to be removed by the Father. They're about to be removed by the Lord because they're the Holy Spirits. They're spirit-filled. When Jesus came, he said, I think it was Matthew 5, he said, I am, come, I am not come but for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Who's Israel? Mark's portion. He's He's... He's got to come and shed that light, which he's going to do on the workers that are going to work during seals. They're going to receive his light and they're going to go out and spread the light during the time of seals to wake up the house of Israel, which is with the Gentiles grafted in, scattered throughout the earth. That's who he came for. So who do you think that's a picture of? Rachel? You see? And then what did he have to do? Then he served six more years for the cattle, which yes, is a typology picture of Judah. And what happened when the 20 years were done? When the 20 years were done, seven, seven, and six, he makes a covenant with his father-in-law. What do we know happens at the end of this 20 year big picture or at the end of the 13th year of seals uh, of tribulation what do we know the lord does daniel 9 27 he confirms the covenant he confirms the covenant that he made at the end of seals which was the new covenant he made with the house of israel and with the house of judah not as his fathers but this was the new covenant in the end of days and he's going to confirm it right here after that tribulation is all done, Matthew's portion is over, and the Lord returns at the beginning of the 14th year, feet down on the Mount of Olives. So once tribulation starts at trumpets, at the Feast of Trumpets, you're going to have seven years of seals. You're going to have seven years of trumpets. But at the end of the 
13th year of seals and trumpets, the Lord will return, feet down on the Mount of Olives, and quote unquote, clean up, if you will, or prepare everything in that final year. Which means there's a picture of what? A wedding. That means there's a wedding, a picture of a wedding that, uh, uh, like a, 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 an agreed upon wedding that is going to take place at the end of 13 years. Okay, it, it's an official marriage. But when you guys know the storyline of it, everybody loves to talk about it by going to Matthew. And when they do, they think it's all about the beginning. They put it all at the beginning as a pre-trib. <laughs> but it's literally the end of tribulation. He goes and what? Has to prepare a place for a year. He's got to go and deal with things for a year. He's going to clean up the earth and everything else. And then what happens? Then you have the final marriage at the end of the 14th year or the start of the 15th. Same thing, right? The one day, hour difference. Okay. So at the end of 14 years, then the official wedding and everything, the celebration of all of it takes place. And when does it take place? <laughs> That's my trumpet blast. That's the sound of the trumpet. When do you think that is? When do you think that trumpet blast is in a Jewish Hebrew year? And which wedding is that going to be? Well, it certainly wasn't the Gentile wedding. The Gentile wedding happens in the first seven days of the 50 before the 14 years begins. But then he gets what? Then he was given Rachel, right? For which he still had to fulfill seven years. And you realize that he never had seven, he, he never had kids with her. She was barren for the first seven years. Then she had children. Hello. But you know what you find out? There is no wedding story in scriptures with Rachel. There was only Leah's. Leah's was right here. Rachel's isn't talked about. But what do we know Jesus came for? Jesus came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Right? And then there's another sheep, uh, uh, another uh, uh, um, herd, if you will, that he that isn't his, that he has to bring as well. So we know, and we can prove it, we'll, we'll share on this again as well, that there's another wedding at the end of tribulation. You see? Well, guess what? You're also going to see by the end of it, there's yet another one in this exact same picture, but spread over the entirety of creation with the millenniums. It's awesome. It's awesome. These things are revealed, guys. It is understood. You see, remember this with Leah? Let's go to this one. Let's go back to 29. And we see, okay, uh, Leah, seen but a few days. So uh, give me my wife, my days are fulfilled that I may go in unto her. And Laban gathered together all the men of the place and made a feast. You see, what feast is this? It's the wedding feast. And it says in Genesis 29, 23, and it came to pass in evening, in the evening that he took Leah, his daughter, and brought her in uh, and brought her to him. And he went in unto her. And Laban gave unto his daughter Leah, Zilpah, may, uh, his maid for a handmaiden. And it came to pass in the morning, behold, it was Leah. And he said to Laban, what is this that thou hast done unto? Could you imagine this happening in our modern day and age? You're expecting, you know, you're, you're marrying the one daughter and he's got another daughter. That's the older one. And you didn't really, you, you don't want that one. You, you've been in love with this one. And she was wearing a veil and it had to be all kind of hush hush. You couldn't remove the veil and you wake up in the morning to find that out. Oh, my goodness. I couldn't imagine what he felt. So 
And it says, and he said to Laban, what is this that thou hast done unto me? Did not I serve with thee for Rachel? Wherefore hast thou beguiled me? Laban said, it must not be so, it must not be done so in our country to give the younger before the firstborn, fulfill her week, okay? Fulfills her week and we know he gets Rachel, but he now has to complete seven years as well. But now let's look at, this is always the important part right here. In our country, to give, it is not to be done in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. What is this story of the younger before the firstborn? It's the absolute picture of the two wheat harvests. There is a spring wheat, as you guys know, and there is a winter wheat. Spring wheat is planted in the spring and harvested late summer to early fall. Winter wheat is sown in the fall, maybe early winter, but generally the very late fall, lives through the winter and is harvested in the summer. You see, this one's much more accurate because it's just straightforward. It's generally very late summer to very early fall, or, uh, um, and the, the winter wheat, which is planted very late fall, is harvested somewhere around midish summer. It's, it's in summer, all right? W what is the difference between these two wheats? One is older, one is younger. It's literally called the older and the younger. In Hebrew, this is something I was trying to share with you guys in the past, and I couldn't remember where the write-up was about it. There's the difference between Kadosh and Yoshon. Kadosh is spring wheat is called Kadosh, and winter wheat is called Yoshon. You can go to read this for yourselves. It's hope-of-israel.org, two wheat harvests. You can go read it all for yourself. But what it is, is the spring crops, you can say U.S. or everywhere, are generally planted after Passover and are harvested toward the end of summer. It's, remember, late summer to early fall. Therefore, uh, uh, therefore, from the harvest until the following Passover, they are kadosh. Until when? The following Passover. We've shared on this a, many, a number of times, right? And that means kadosh. Kadosh wheat means new wheat. It means new. It means the younger wheat. And they're not allowed to have it from when it's harvested in late summer, early fall. They cannot use it until the following year at Passover on day two on the 16th of, of Nisan is when it then becomes Yoshan as winter wheat always is. Then they could use it. This spring wheat kadosh is the younger, which is Rachel. Winter wheat, <laughs> which is Yoshan, is usable immediately. Winter wheat is planted, just as we were saying, in late fall or early winter, harvested in late spring or early summer. That's not true. It's, well, like I said, it's, it's definitely usually midish summer, more 100%, well, 90%, 99% more than likely. Since winter wheat is planted before Passover and is harvested after Passover, it is always Yoshan. You see, spring wheat is planted in the spring and is harvested in late summer or early fall. Since spring wheat is usually planted after Passover, one must wait until the following Passover before spring wheat becomes Yoshan. You see, Kadosh restrictions begin at the end of summer and last until the following Passover. This is what we've been teaching here for a long time. It is the definition, it is the answer of Leah and Rachel. That you cannot have the younger, the newer one, before the firstborn older one. The older one is always ready first. Firstborn, you see? And the younger one is later. It is the revelation of winter wheat and spring wheat. You understand the timing that equals? This is the period right here when winter wheat is harvested. 
Do you know when spring wheat is harvested? Spring wheat is harvested right in this period here. Do you think we're going all the way to here for pre-trib escape? No, because the revelation is Leah who goes first. And it is 50 days before the Feast of Trumpets. From attack one to attack two with the pre-trib escape at the beginning. So what does that mean? That means that when the Lord comes after six years of seals, okay, after the six years from the red horse rider to the end of the sixth year of seals, the Lord is going to be seen coming. When do you expect the Lord's going to be coming at the end of that sixth year? Do you think it's probably going to be the Feast of Trumpets? Do you think the Lord God and his entire plan is perfectly laid out? Do you think if it says 14 years, it's going to be 14 years, uh, five months, uh, 26 days, and five hours? Or do you think it's going to be six years or the total 14 or 14 years? Do you think the entire picture of 21,000 years is going to fall exactly at 21,000 and then eternity begins at 22nd with the new earth, heaven and new earth? Or do you think it's going to be like 21,692 years and seven months and three days? No. I'm always reminded of something that uh, Chuck Missler said years ago. It's one of those things. I don't know why it's stuck in my mind, but he had said, one thing you can bank on is we may not know the day and hour. Well, I'm going to share some of that with you today. But. He says, when the tribulation begins, you can bank on it when it's going to end because it'll be seven years later. I always remember that. Now, we know he didn't know what we know. But I'm going to help you understand the day and hour no one knows. And I'm going to use scripture to prove it to you. But in relation to when the Lord returns, if at the red horse rider, is the beginning of the 14 years and the Lord's returning after six years, when do you think he's returning? When, when, and I don't mean returning feet down. I mean at the end of six years of seals, when they all see him and hide his rocks, fall on us and, and uh, 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 when he comes on heavenly Mount Zion. When do you think he's coming? I think I can pretty much assure you it'll be at trumpets. And I'm going to break down. I'm going to explain to you why. But what do we know about this? What is trumpets? The beginning of the first month or seventh month or first month to the, to the Jews. What would be seven months later? What would be seven months later? It would be Nisan, right? Because Adar being the 12th month or the sixth month from, from, uh, uh, um, from Tishri, Adar is the six months, right? So you got seventh month, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, that's six, which means Nisan is the seventh month. When did it say that they could, that they could use the Kadosh? When does the Kadosh, the younger spring wheat, now become usable after it was harvested? It's not usable until seven months later, on the 16th day. You know why that's amazing, right? We've shared on this before. <clears throat> the incredible revelation of this is the fact that we know, we know that when the Lord comes at the end of the sixth seal, which is the end of six years of, of tribulation, the first six years <clears throat> at the end of the sixth seal, we know that from Mark's discourse, we know they will have seen him come, but they don't know when they're going. We know there's the Ezekiel 39 war. We know that there's the, the, the ceiling of the 144,000. And then what do you have? Then you have the rapture of the great multitude. I find that fascinating. Because we know, and we're going to touch in Mark here for another reason in a moment, 
But when we go to Mark's transfiguration story and we go to nine verse one, and it says uh, partway through some of them standing here, uh, which shall not taste of death till they have seen past tense. The kingdom of God come with power. So they're going to have seen it come. Yet they don't get to go. Not quite yet. Why? Because if he's coming at Tishri six years from now, from Tishri to Tishri six years from now, Kadosh wheat, when it's harvested, that spring wheat is harvested, it cannot be observed until Passover in the seventh month or six months and then Nisan, the seventh month, on the second day of Passover. You understand how incredible that is? And that the one that relates to Mark to that one is saying they will have seen the kingdom of God come. And we know from Mark chapter two that it says what? After six days. So what is after six years? You see, if the 50 days ends right here, which is also the year's end, right? And this is the beginning of, of the 14 years at the Red Horse Rider, then this would be the end of six years. And after six years would be trumpets, All right? Trumpets either happens on day one or day two. We're gonna look into that storyline a little bit more. We're, we're, we're leading into all these things. We're building towards all these things. But I wanted, especially new people, I haven't shared in that kind of detail before, you know, in a while, I should say, the difference between the mid, uh, the pre-trib and the mid-trib. There's an absolute difference between them. Winter wheat and spring wheat, the older before the younger, the, the Yoshan before the Kadosh. And now you guys can see, you can understand it for yourselves. It's right there. It's in scripture. It's, it's literally happening in the physical ground around the earth within the harvests. The actual seasons and times that these things happen. <laughs> you understand that? It's literally the time. So do you understand how the Feast of Weeks, it's physically impossible for the Feast of Weeks to be observed in early mid-spring? or middish spring, the wheat's not ready yet. That's why I was talking about with Deuteronomy, with Deuteronomy chapter 16. In fact, let's go look at it again for a moment because I want to make that point on it, okay? When thou beginnest to put the sickle to the corn, that count begins from the wheat. So then what do you get? We have seven days, okay? So what do we know it starts with? We know it's gonna start with the Feast of Weeks. Then it's gonna be the seven days as seven years, which is called bread of affliction, which relates to Passover and unleavened bread. Okay, what, what portion is that? That's this portion, seven days as a, of unleavened bread as seven years of seals. And then you're gonna have your seven days, whoops. Then you're gonna have your uh, tabernacles, yep. Then you're gonna have your tabernacles, which is seven days, okay? And your tabernacles seven days is your seven years typology of trumpets. And trumpets has what? The eighth day. So in the seven years of trumpets, being like the seven days of tabernacles, you have your seven and then the eighth day, which is, ta-da, new beginning. Funny how that works, right? It's the exact same story as 20 years, 21, and then 22 new beginning. Just like their alphabet, just like when they began in the beginning and it was Taurus, just like Book of Revelation, 22 chapters. It's everywhere and it is all lined up. Let's keep going. 
this is what I was talking about earlier. We've shared on this recently, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. But loaf miss day, okay? Loaf miss is from the weed harvest, and they bring in bread no later than August 1st. So it's late July to the first day of August, and they would bring loaves of bread. What does that sound like? When do you bring in the two wave loaves that are with leaven? Hello. You bring them in at the time of what? The wheat harvest? When the first fruits of the wheat are come in and you can make the bread with it? It's impossible to do that in the middle of spring. Impossible. It's, this is why I'm showing you this. this. This is actual in our life happening. Summer, right? Early-ish midsummer to late summer, early fall. It literally happens in our life. Let me show you something else. I want to remind you of something else that shows this same thing, that we haven't missed it, guys. Remember when I was saying that just like Genesis chapter 1 in the beginning was Taurus, just like we said Exodus, it was Taurus. Who else was it like Taurus? In Enoch's day, which was obviously before Moses, and between Genesis 1, what was it? Taurus. So what do you think these 365 years as days represent? Well, we know that Enoch is connected to his birth and his resurrect or his his uh, uh, his translation was at what? It was at the Feast of Weeks. It was at the Feast of Weeks. So what happens with the same old story that we've been sharing if we count from Taurus on the 16th day as the resurrection day as Sivan being month one from June 5th and we count the seven Sabbaths of the 8th, 15th, 22nd, 29th day, your seventh Sabbath is July 26th. And your 50 days begin July 27, 2023. When would Enoch have been taken this year, according to Taurus? Right here. About July 26th, 2023. You see? Remember, we always talk about this in Hebrews 11, right? Starting in verse 5. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death. Do you know who, de who else doesn't see death? All right? What Jesus said to, to the disciples in the, gospel, in the Gospel of Thomas, the Apocrypha, tell us how our end will be. Jesus said, have you not discovered the end? Uh, have you not discovered then the beginning that you look for the end? For where the beginning is, there will the end be. Blessed is he who will take his place in the beginning. He will know the end and will not experience death. Do you know where the beginning is? If you're listening to this, if you've been following us, we know where the beginning is, guys. The beginning is Taurus, and it was revealed to us all the way from in the beginning. Our brother, you know, many of us understand these worker portions that I'm going to be going into. And in this worker portion, we know there's that first group that's part of the Luke group that is going to remain to stay, that are his remnant workers that are going to stay. Okay, they're going to serve him. I'm going to show the connection between the wedding in Mark, uh, uh, the wedding in Luke, and the wedding in Matthew, and those differences, right? The Gentile wedding at the beginning compared to that Jewish wedding at the end, and bring us into the final wedding at the end of the millennium. So, as that leads all into that, you know, one of our brothers had made an interesting post, and I had considered it as well that 
those who will not taste of death. Well, if we're told here, even though it's an apocryphal book, either it's true or it's not, but this would be a real waste of breath and a waste of writing in these apocryphas that survived and that these guys that were found. If this wasn't true, what would be the point? But this has more than one meaning. Not only is it talking about a pre-trib group, for example, you know, that we know from Luke, Mark, and Matthew groups that won't taste of death before the Lord comes pre-trib, mid-trib, and post-trib. This is talking about a group who find the beginning. And who is he talking to? He's talking to his disciples. We know the disciples are also a reference of the Luke workers. And for whoever finds the beginning will find the end and will not taste of death. Well, the disciples are workers. We know that during their work of seals, they're putting their necks on the line. We know they relate to Smyrna. But what does Smyrna say? Some of you shall taste of death. So we know not all the, the seals workers, those with the Lord for 40 days and then here during seals, we know not all of them are going to taste of death. Do you know what's encouraging in that? Here in Ministry Revealed, all of those that believe they are or were shown or believe they may be workers, which ones do you think they are? Aha, that's an interesting thought, isn't it? If there are a group of workers in this ministry, which I absolutely believe a portion of them are, which ones out of the two, those who die or those who don't die, would be from this ministry? I'm not saying this is the thus saith the Lord. I'm just reading you this. Because this says that those who find the beginning find the end. And we have found the beginning to reveal the end. Because in the end, there is the beginning. Hello. And whoever does will not experience death. So is it possible that those who are being prepared in this ministry, having found the beginning to find the end, are the seals workers that will not experience death? How's that? How about that one, guys? That's pretty wild thought, isn't it? Don't go saying, Alan said, I'm a worker and I'm not going to taste of death. I can go through seal. No, I'm saying, look at what it said. And the possibility that it's probable. Highly possible. I just thought that was really cool. Okay, so what do we see here in Enoch? We're talking still about this portion of time of Enoch, who is a picture of pre-trib, which relates to what? Well, 365 years is a picture of 365 days. And we know to the Father that the Feast of Weeks is a year's end. It's not the only year's end. It is a year's end, but not the only one. But to the Father, that's his. We know it from Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9 said 70 weeks. That's 70 feasts of weeks. To the Father, it starts in the Feast of Weeks. That's why what? That's why the 50 days, you see, the above portion of the pre-trib group has nothing to do with trumpets. It has nothing to do with this year's end to trumpets of the Lord's coming at the end of seals or at the end of trumpets. It's to the Lord's Father God's end, which is the Feast of Weeks. That's why you have everything beginning at the true Feast of Weeks and then everything beginning at trumpets. Because there's two ends. One's the Father's. One's Judas. It's, let, let's go to Daniel 9 real quick, just to make this point on it. 
This is where a lot of people got messed up with it, right? We go to Daniel 9. 70 weeks are determined upon thy people. What does the word weeks mean? Shabua. What does it mean for anybody that's new? I'm just making a point for those that have been here for a little bit. What does it mean? Let me show you. Look at what it says. It can be a seven-day period of weeks, right? But it's also a reference of what? The Feast of Weeks. It is also a reference to the Feast of Weeks. Hello. There are two connections to end. And so when we see this with Enoch, and he, we know anybody that does a study on Enoch knows that his connection is to, where, where did it go? Is that he was born and take, oh, give me a break. That he was born and taken on Shavuot at the true Feast of Weeks. See, most people don't get it yet that it's not Pentecost. We know better. But Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks, is when Enoch was born and when Enoch was taken, not having seen death. What does 365 relate to? 365 is to us a year's end, which is precisely what the Father said it was to him. 70 weeks. That's, a, that's an end, a start and an end to the Father. 70 Feast of Weeks. Why would he be counting 70 from Feast of Weeks if it didn't count as an end to him? This is why in Deuteronomy 16, it's the beginning of everything. Deuteronomy 16 reads a 717 for the feast. That's the mystery of the 717 revelation. It's the mystery of God's name that looks like 717 going from left to right or right to left, right? yod heh vav -Hey. But it looks like there's a little comma too. So it looks like 7 comma 1 7 going from right to left. The 1 is the Feast of Weeks. The seven on the left is unleavened bread, and the seven on the right is the seven of, Trump, of, of tabernacles. It's wild to understand, guys. But everybody going pre-trib is just like Enoch. Notice how it's before the 40 days of Noah. Hello. What, what are these 40 days of Noah? Right? When do the 40 days of Noah start? After the translation of Enoch, or those as Enoch, who are what? Those that would not see death because God had translated him, because he had a testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him, God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So when was he taken? At true Feast of Weeks. And what happens after he's taken? There's a Leah wedding. The Leah wedding that lasts for seven days. It even reveals it here. Because what happens on the eighth day? Just like the story of the ark. You got the story of Noah. And the 40 days beginning. Man, it's everywhere. Guys, it is so awesome. It just blows me away. You know, here's another one. This is on uh, Bikram, which is first fruits. The holiday of Shavuot is called the Feast of Harvest, the first fruits of thy labors. In Leviticus, of course, it's described as uh, on Shavuot, referring to it as Bikram, which is first fruits of the weed harvest. Hello. <laughs> it's the first fruits of the weed harvest. Who are the first fruits? Firstborn. Older, Leia, the Yoshon wheat. And then you guys will remember this, right? It is held on the second or third September of every year for hundreds of years, which is the celebration of wine, okay? Which is for the celebration of new wine when the new wine is ready. They observe it every year here for hundreds of years within the second to third week of September for hundreds of years, just like they were doing with the wheat 
and bringing in the leavened bread over here. Do you, do, you, do you understand how it literally happens? Like, this is what I'm saying. These things are literally happening in our harvest cycles on earth. They're literally happening. We're not out of whack. We're, we're not miscounting. We're not exaggerating things. How on earth could you observe wine where they're telling you back here when weed isn't even ready? Craziness. There are no grapes. There's not even a bulb of a grape on, on a branch at that point. This is why it's always observed here. So what do you think it means at the end of the six years of seals, if this is the end of the sixth year of seals, and it starts at Tishri 1, which is generally in this range of uh, September to early October. <clears throat> What's ready? Grapes. Who is representing as the first fruits of grapes? The 144,000. And who's ready at about the same time as the 144,000 at the end of the sixth year of seals? The 144,000 that gets sealed first at the time of the grape harvest. But what else happens? It's also the time of the spring wheat harvest. But it can't be observed until Passover the following year. Which is why when the grape harvest, <clears throat> first fruits, represented by the 144,000 are sealed first, they're going to help bring in that group that will have seen the Lord coming, but not yet go, because the 144,000 are going to help the seals workers to bring in the Kadosh wheat harvest of the great multitude of Revelation 7. Everything is in order, guys. Every piece is in order. <clears throat> Let's go to our trusted e-sword and let's build on some incredible points. <clears throat> we know here very, very well. I just want to check something real quick. Okay. We know very, very well from Luke chapter 12, the different worker groups. I, I'm not sure where people get, you know, first, second, third, fourth watch. I'm not sure how that lines up with the fourth watch, because in Scripture, in the New Testament through Luke, we have three watches. We've explained them. We know them well. We know all, everything practically is three portions. Spirit, light, flesh. Holy Ghost, Son, Father. Luke, Mark, Matthew. Pre, mid, post. Seven, seven, seven. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. And you're even going to see this in a third wedding. Crazy. So <clears throat> we know in Luke chapter 12, okay, um, we'll just go right down here, the usual place. <coughs> Excuse me. In 1235. But you could see even in Luke uh, 1232, fear not little flock. Okay, we know this is when they go out. <clears throat> He's letting them know when they're going to be going out. And he says uh, in verse 32, fear not little flock. Okay, this is that first group of workers, that Luke remnant worker portion. For it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Now remember 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 5, right? There's a group that he's reserved, right? That he's kept watch over that are reserved, that will be revealed in the end of days, and they have their place reserved in heaven. <clears throat> so he's telling you, don't worry when you go out. You're protected. Don't worry about what you're going to eat. Don't worry about what you're going to drink. Don't worry about any of those things. I've got you covered. People will take care of you throughout your journeys. And the kingdom, you're already a part of it. All right? So fear not. So then we get to verse 35. Let your loins be girded about and your lights burning and you yourselves like unto men that wait for the Lord when he will return from the wedding that when he cometh and knocketh, you may open unto him immediately. 
You see, when we go back to that Leah story, Rachel, Jacob, all that, this is that Leah, the one he didn't really want. Remember, because Jesus is coming for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's the world, the, the Gentiles grafted in. That's who he really came for. He's not coming for those who are already saved, who are spirit filled. He wants to save the lost. You see, that's, that's the seals group. So what we're seeing here is this group that's about to work that are going to serve him during that time. We've talked on this before, but I'm building to show you more insight into it. So this is that revelation of the first group that he, he's letting them know, which we shared in the live show. He's letting them know right before the pre-trib happens, however long, a day, a few hours, moments before, I don't know. This is the evidence of him letting this remnant Luke worker group know that he's take he's going to the wedding. And when he returns, he's going to come and knock and they're to be ready. So he's letting them know he's gone for seven days, returning on the eighth day. Who on earth knows about this? Us. A group that found the beginning to find the end. A group that wouldn't taste of death. A, a, a portion of Smyrna. Of which Smyrna, some die, but not all. You see how it all builds together? It's insanity. So, I will only return from the wedding. When he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you, that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down, and he will come forth and serve them. We've covered this many times. We'll briefly cover it again. We know this is the Luke 24 group in the picture of when he comes after his resurrection. The only group he sits down to serve and eat with is the one from Luke chapter 24. Not in Mark, not in Matthew. So we know that that Luke 24 group is the remnant portion that followed him for 40 days. They are the Smyrna group of which some will die putting their necks on the line, and some won't die. And then it says in verse 38, And if he shall come in the second watch, or come in the third watch, and, so, and find them so, blessed are those servants. See, there's no fourth watch. The first one is the ones that were ready that he pre-told. The second and the third is the mark group that is at the end of seals, the 144,000. And they're going to work trumpets. They're going to help out the end to bring in the rapture. And then you have them working during the seven years of trumpets. And then it says the third. Who is the third? We know that as the end of Matthew's uh, gospel, right? The ones that are going to go out during the millennial reign. They go out during the millennial reign. They're represented as the gates through which people will come and worship the Lord during the time of the millennial reign. That is the first, second, and third watch. That is the absolute revelation of the typologies being spoken of here. We've shared on it a number of times. Um, listen to verse 12, 39. And this know that if the good man of the house had known at what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken through. Now, who is this speaking to? Right? Listen to what it says next. Be ye therefore ready also, for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when you think not. Verse 41. Then Peter said unto them, Lord, speakest thou this parable unto us, or even unto all? Okay? You're starting to get a little bit of understanding. He's like, are you saying this to us, or are you speaking this to everybody? Why, why did he jump in to say this? Well, there's three portions of watches, right? There's, there's the end of Luke, the end of Mark, the end of Matthew, right? Which is to, to right before seals, right? At the, uh, uh, during the 50 days that will be here during seals. You got the end of seals and then you got the end of trumpets. So you say, you speaking this to all or just to some of us? And the Lord answered and said, who then is a faithful and wise steward um, whom his Lord will make ruler over his household to give them meat in due season. Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. You go down to 45 and it says, but in if. That servant 
saith in his heart, my Lord delayeth his coming, begins to beat and be drunken, then that one will come at what? A day when he looketh not for him, and an hour when he is not aware, and his, point, his portion will be uh, with the unbelievers. So you're getting three groups being described here. This first group is, as we all know, the Luke 24 group, the only group he comes to eat with, right? And we see it right here. It was the two on the road to Emmaus where he sits to eat with them. I don't know why I always lose track. Oh, here it is. In verse there, I even got them super highlighted so I wouldn't lose track. Um, in Luke 24, 30, and it came to pass as he sat at meat with them, he took bread, blessed it, break it, and gave it to them. You see, he took the bread, he broke it, he served them, he was there eating with them. This is that group when he returns from the wedding. When you go to the end of Mark, there is a reason, guys. I know we know this. When we go to Mark chapter 16, starting in verse 14, we see after he appeared unto the eleven, as they sat and ate, he unbraided. So he railed on them because they didn't believe the testimony of what? The type, the typology, the two on the road to Emmaus, saying, the Lord is here, the Lord's coming, right? They, they didn't believe it. It's the same picture of the Smyrna group who is coming and getting the 144,000 to wake up, saying, no, it's true, it's coming. But they weren't ready. They weren't watching, right? And what did he say? That if they weren't watching, he would come at an hour, they think not. It says so, and he unbraided with their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believed not them which had seen him after he had risen. And we see what? That theirs is to do something different than it was in Luke. When you go see the commission, it's, it's a different story. And we know this is all relating to the 144,000. When does this period take place? After six days. What does that mean, after six days? What does it relate to? Well, if this is the picture in six years from now, when Tishri 1 begins the 14 years, so this is the end here of six years from now, that would mean the end of six years, which is the end of the sixth year of seals, that means the Lord is here at the time of trumpets, right? Either day one or day two of trumpets, of the feast of trumpets. And here he is. They came and they told him they didn't believe. And then what ends up happening? He's there with them. And we know they're going to be the ones chosen, be the anointed ones, uh, uh, um, sealed, right? In Revelation chapter seven. They're going to start by bringing in, helping those bring in the great multitude rapture, and then they're going out during trumpets. They're giving greater power and, and, and can't die. Okay. When we go to Matthew, we see the third watch. At the end of Matthew, look at the Great Commission. Then the 11 disciples went into Galilee into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. Uh, and when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Verse 18, and Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go and teach all nations. We've taught on this many times. They're no longer preaching the word. Right? There's no more preaching who the Lord is. Because he has returned. All power is his in heaven and on earth. He then says, teaching all things. So the very end of Matthew ends teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I commanded you, and lo, I am with you even until the end of the world. Why? Because this is him here at the end of tribulation. Even at the end of the 13th year. He's here for that one year, setting things in order, and what happens? He's now here until the end of the world. See, when is all power given unto him in heaven and on earth? At the, at the seventh trumpet. See? So at the end of this 13 years, seven of seals and six of trumpets, which is the end of the what? 
of the second woe. That's the end of the sixth trumpet. What happens when the seventh trumpet begins to sound? Everything is his in heaven and on earth. The mystery of God is over. That's why Matthew says that. That's why it says he's now here with them until the end of the world. But it's also why they only now need to go out and teach and not preach. The Luke group is the first watch. The Mark group at the end is the second watch. The group at the end of Matthew is the third watch, which is the millennial reign. When is the one for Luke? When is the one for Mark? And when is the time of the one for Matthew? When does he come? And then says, all power is now his. In heaven and on earth. I just showed you, it's at the beginning of the seventh trumpet. When the whole world sees him come as lightning from one end to the other. Hello. So when is it? We know when it is. It's going to be at the end of the 13th year of tribulation or the end after the six years are done, which is what? It would have to be Elul 29. So after Elul 29, which means he'll start that final year and be here till the end of the millennium, it will begin at what? It'll begin at trumpets. Which means at the end of the sixth year of seals, right? So when after six days ends, the first year would be trumpets. If it's going to start on trumpets, then the end of those first six years will end and will begin on trumpets, whether it's day one or day two of Tishri. Then you got the seventh year of seals. Then the trumpets judgments begin. And at the end of six years, right? Remember, he's here for a bit and then he's gone. After the rebuilding, he's cut off. And when he returns feet down, we know it's what? After six days or six years, which would be the six of trumpets, the six years of trumpets. So what would be the after six years of trumpets? The Feast of Trumpets. The Feast of Trumpets. This would be the beginning of the seventh year of trumpets. What happens at the beginning of the seventh year of trumpets? He says, all power in heaven and on earth is now his. What, what happens when he comes and is here for that final 14th year and has started at trumpets? There's one more year where he's going to what? He's going to Ezekiel, uh, uh, sorry, Zechariah, what do I call it? Zechariah 14 him, right? He's going to be feet down on the, on the Mount of Olives. The whole world will have seen him from one end to the other. He's going to destroy the enemies. Re, re, water's going to go out and replenish from him at the end. And what happens? It's the end of 14 years. When would the end of the 14th year be? 29th of Elul. And when would be the start of the millennial reign? Connected to trumpets? Feast of trumpets? At the blasting of the shofar? Yeah. You got it. At the blasting of the shofar? Let's see if we can prove this out. Watch this. When we go to Luke's, uh, Luke's transfiguration story, we see in Luke's transfiguration story a great mystery that I was talking about in the intro that we revealed oh, two or three years ago now, but it troubled me for a year and a half because we've understood mark and matthews you've heard me say this story before we've understood mark and matthews transfiguration story for years and luke's was the one that was the biggest mystery because in luke chapter 9 verse 28 well actually let's read verse 27 first you're going to find enoch's group right here but i tell you of a truth there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the kingdom of God. This is the pre-trib group. When are they going to see the kingdom of God? Bang, just like that. They, will, they won't experience death until, bang, they're going to see the kingdom of God. That means next moment, gone. That's your pre-trib. There's no past tense. Till they see it, bang, when you see it, bang. 
That's when you're there. When is this period of time? Well, look at what it says. And it came to pass about an eight days after these sayings. So where Mark and Matthew talk about six, this says about an eight days. And for the longest time, it drove me crazy until we realized, what does this mean? There's your seven years, which makes what? The first year of seals, right? The very beginning of the first year of seals, which we now know is trumpets. The very first moment of the beginning of the seals tribulation, the beginning of the 14 years is what? Well, remember the story? This is a story of 22 years. So if these are the first seven, this is the eighth year. So it said it was what? About an eighth day. So it wasn't quite the eighth, but it was close. Okay? About an eighth day. It was close to the eighth day. Well, that's pretty bizarre wording, don't you think? That's bizarre wording. Came to pass about an eight days. Well, in Mark's transfiguration, we saw a moment ago, it was that some of you shall not taste of death till you have seen the kingdom of God come with power and glory, right? Well, six days as what? Six years. So you've got the completed six years of seals. And what do we have at the end of the sixth year of seals? What's at the end of the sixth year of seals? Hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne. And the wrath of the Lamb for the great day of his wrath has come. What is it? What, what's immediately after the sixth? There he is coming. And he has what? One more year to fulfill. So you got what? Six days as six years. And what happened to them? It's the end of the sixth, right? So it's the end of the sixth. And what happens? We see them all saying, hide us. They all see it coming. They see him coming on heavenly Mount Zion. But what did Mark tell us in chapter 9, verse 1? That some standing here will not taste the death, right? Not all of them are going to die during, during seals, right? Not all of the rapture group are going to be dead during seals. Many will have died, but the majority will survive to the end of seals, to the rapture. And what does it say? They will have seen. It's past tense. Because at the end of the sixth year, they will have seen it come but yet they don't yet know when they're going. And we know because they are spring wheat that even though their harvest time is at this point, their full observing time is until Passover the following year, which is about the midst of the seventh year. Just like Revelation chapter seven. And then when we go to Matthews, let me show you Matthews. We'll come back to Luke's in a second. We go to Matthew, we'll start at the last verse of 16, verse 28. And it says, Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Well, that's very different than Mark and Luke as well, isn't it? When are they going to see him coming in his kingdom? How about when he comes as lightning from one end unto the other and all of heaven and everything on earth is given unto him, just like Matthew 28 said. So when you get to 17, look at what it says. When is that time connected to? After six days. What is Matthew's after six days? Six years of trumpets. So when is he going to be seen as everything being given to him in heaven and on earth? After six days or after six years in the typology of trumpets what do we see at the end of the sixth seal to start i mean the end of the sixth trumpet to start the seventh trumpet everything in heaven on earth is now the lord's so when is it after six days so what would be the end of after six days or after six years well if it begins on the feast of trumpets it will be end on the end of Elul. Which means what? His coming is connected to what? The end of Elul and then what? That beginning of the seventh year of seals would start on trumpets. 
the first or second day of Tishri. The sixth year would come to an end at the same time. It started at trumpets. It's going to end at trumpets, right? Or at the last day, and he's going to start his seventh year at the Feast of Trumpets on the first or second of Tishri. Don't you worry. I'm going to be able to prove this out to you. <clears throat> Which one didn't? Which one didn't have after six days? Okay, so you got your after six years of seals. There's your end of six years of seals, which means the beginning of the seventh is trumpets. Then you've got your six years of trumpets come to an end of the of the feast. Uh, uh, sorry, of the uh, trumpet tribulation, and you come to the end of those six years of the trumpet portion of tribulation, and seventh year starts at the feast of trumpets, first or second of Tishri. Right? Which one doesn't? Which one doesn't? Only Luke's. Only Luke's. That's why Luke's was so much more difficult to understand. Because we knew it was six and then seventh year of seals. Six years of trumpets and then seventh year of trumpets. What was this about in eight days all about? Well, for one, it was telling us it wasn't quite the it wasn't quite the eighth year. You see, very different. It wasn't after six. It was sometime in the seventh, not quite the eighth. Well, we had the revelation of 50 days. We know what it is. It's Jacob's flew by as days, the final 50 days of the seven years. It's the creation, only a couple verses given because he was so excited to create. But what else was it? It had a dual meaning. Because it's about what? If the end of Mark's is when he comes at the end of six years of seals, which means he's coming at trumpets, and the after six of trumpets, which is when he's coming at the Feast of Trumpets to start the seventh, this isn't six. It's about his coming at the end of six to start the seventh at the Feast of Trumpets. It's his coming feet down at the end of six to start the seventh year of trumpets at the Feast of Trumpets. Luke's wasn't. But it has to be related to what? To his coming in the typology of what? The 40 days. Well, isn't that amazing? Because not only is it a picture saying not quite the eighth year as the others were related to days as years. It's not only a picture of that. As the others are also a picture of his coming. So was Luke's. When do we know Jesus is coming? He's coming as the Son of Man after what? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. He's coming about an eighth day when he returns after the wedding. So not only is it close to the eighth year, which is the start of the next seven, which is why it said about in a relation to days as years as Mark and Matthew, but it was also a picture of him coming as the day to years were in Mark and Matthew. But in Luke's, when is he coming? On the eighth day, what? After the wedding. When he comes this time, at the beginning, he's coming for the 40 days as the white horse rider, son of man. And when he's gone, we know he leaves with about three days left before the anointing of the Holy Ghost happens on the very last day of the year, and then bang, the attack on Jerusalem and the beginning of the 14 years of tribulation. At what? At trumpets. But when he came for his 40 days, it didn't start at trumpets. So what happens when we go to Luke's discourse? Let's go to these famous places 
people like to go to. And let's read what it says. Here's your dividing verse right here. So this is all about what? Okay. We know it's there. There's the coming of the Son of Man portion in Luke. We've talked about it. Listen to Luke 21, 34. And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with the suffering and drunkenness and cares of this life, so that that day come upon you unawares. For as a snare shall it come upon all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch ye therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Okay, then early in the morning they came to the temple. We know this relates to Luke, uh, John chapter 8. Okay, do you see any conversation about not knowing the day or hour? Nope. Nothing about not knowing the day or hour. What about this? What, what, about, what about Luke's transfiguration? It's different. Remember, almost an eighth year and also relates to him coming at his 40 days that is in that portion of almost the eighth year, coming after the wedding on the eighth day, right? At about the end of that seven-day wedding, he's coming on the eighth day. Okay. It's not going to be at trumpets. It's not going to the eighth year, which is the beginning of seals. It's before. And so it just so happens Luke's discourse says nothing about the day and hour. What happens when we go to Mark's? Let's go to Mark's discourse. We've broken down these discourses, man. Absolutely incredible to be able to understand them as we do. Okay? We go to Luke's discourses. Uh, sorry, we go to Mark's discourse. And here it is. Uh, we'll start with the coming of the Son of Man. Okay? In 1324. But in those days after that tribulation. What do you mean after that tribulation? after the six days as years. How do we know? Because the picture is a typology of the Lord coming in Mark's transfiguration story. We've got a video. The pre, mid, and post video is a picture of the stories in the three gospels that are a picture of pre, mid, and post. So when we see the six days as six years, okay, then what do we get? The story of him coming. So what is this picture of him coming as? The end of the sixth year seals. Right? He's coming at the very end, after the sixth day. So at the beginning of trumpets, at the end of six, after six, the end of the sixth seal, to the start of the beginning of the seventh year, it says, but in those days, after that tribulation, the sun and the moon uh, shall, not, shall be darkened and shall not give their light. The stars of heaven shall fall. And the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in. So again, he's still in the clouds, not on. With power and great glory. And then shall he send his angels and shall gather his elect from the four winds, from the uttermost part of the earth to the uttermost part of heaven. Okay, there he is coming. Well, look at what you get in verse 31. That same dividing verse, Luke, Mark, and Matthew's discourse, this is the exact same wording, word for word, in all three of them. And listen to what it says next. But of that day and that hour knoweth no man. No, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Take heed, watch and pray, for you know not when the time is. For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey and left his house and gave authority to his servants and to every man his work and commanded the porter to watch. Okay? For what, uh, for, uh, and what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. What's it connected to? The day and hour. The day and hour that no one knows. He says what? I gave my authority to my servants. 
You know, guys, be watching. Who's he talking to here? He's talking to the ones from Luke 24. He's talking to the servants that, that he chose that were with him during the 40 days, that were with him during seals. They're Smyrna. He's telling them. He went on a far journey and gave authority to his servants. So you guys be watching. But listen to what he says. Who are the ones that are going to be watching, do you think? Outside of those, you might wake up, right? The, the great multitude that are coming in and everything else. But he's talking to his servants who he gave authority to and saying everybody needs to. But the conversation here is to his servants who are Smyrna that he sealed at the end of Luke. Right? The ones here with him for 40 after the wedding. He's given it to them. And he's told them to watch. Isn't that amazing that we went to the end of Mark and it was the two on the road to Emmaus that go to the ones and they didn't believe them? Who were the ones that were watching that told these guys representative of the 144,000, hey, the Lord has come. And the 144,000 who he unbraids on, they weren't ready, right? They were like, eh, whatever. These are the ones who were watching. This is them. And what does he say about this time? It's a day and hour that no one knows. Huh. Let's go read what Matthew. So this is the end of what? When, when is the Lord coming? At the end of the sixth year of seals. So if he's coming at the end of the sixth year of seals, Right after six days as years, then that means he's coming at the Feast of Trumpets. Either the first or the second day of trumpets. Let's go see what Matthew 24 says. We know that during trumpets time, we know the 144,000 are working. And look at what we see about the coming of the Son of Man. Immediately after the tribulation of those days. What tribulation of those days is he talking about? These right here. What does he go on to say? The sun shall be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, and the stars of heaven shall uh, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And and then shall all the tribes, you see, now you get the word tribes. That's because it's related to the tribes, right? We've shared on this before. Those that will be the gates of the earth shall mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in. This is the word on. In Luke and in Mark, it's only in the cloud or in the clouds. In Matthews, it's when he returns, feet down on the Mount of Olives, when he's coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. Remember what happens at the seventh trumpet? When you read it in Revelation chapter 10. In Revelation chapter 10, it says, At the beginning of the sound of the seventh trumpet, when it shall begin to sound, the mystery of God shall be finished. Okay? At the beginning of that seventh trumpet, that beginning of the seventh year, feast of trumpets, he's sounding the shofar. The mystery is over, okay? And sounding the trumpet, uh, uh, and shall gather together the elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Look at this, 24 verse 35. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. See, the exact same in all of them. Now listen to 24, 36. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels in heaven, but the Father only, but as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. We all know this word coming. We've broken it down many times. This word, let me show just for new people. This word for coming, out of all the Gospels, out of all the discourses, it's only used in Matthew's discourse. How about that, right? Why do you think that is? 
if it'll go. Why do you, oh man, what's going on here? Oh, it's working. So why do you think that is? You're going to see it right here. Okay. Oops, it didn't, wasn't it? Where is it? There we go. Come on, come on, come on. All right. So look at where we see it. Matthew 24, Matthew 24, Matthew 24, Matthew 24. So four times in all of the discourses, it's only used in Matthew 24 for this word coming. Why do you think that is? Because this is the coming of him returning feet down on the Mount of Olives when everyone will see him. What do we know the story of Noah then relates to in Matthew 24? The final year remaining of what? Well, when does he return? At the end of the sixth trumpet. Which would be when? At the end of the six years. After six years, right? Six years, six days of six years. So when the seventh trumpet begins to sound, which is at the very beginning of the 14th year, like Zechariah 14, it, it's right at the beginning of the 14th year, what happens? <laughs> the Lord has returned, feet down on the Mount of Olives. When would it be? Feast of Trumpets, the first or second of Tishri. How do we know? Did you notice my point? The day and hour no one knows. Luke doesn't have it. And Luke says about an eight days, and we know the two portions that it relates to as days and years. And Mark's is after six days, which is the very beginning of the seventh year. And Matthew's is the end of six days, the end of six years, which is the end of the sixth year of trumpets. One is the end of six years of seals. One is the end of six years of trumpets. And only Mark. And only Matthew <clears throat> both tell us, but of that day and hour, <coughs> excuse me, knoweth no man. But of that day and hour, after six years, knoweth no man. This is about an eighth day, not quite the eighth year, or it probably would have had the day and hour. No one knows. Only Mark's after six years, only Matthew's after six years, and only Mark, no one knows the day and hour, and only Matthew, no one knows the day and hour. Well, do you guys remember the ancient Hebrew wedding? Do you remember the story of 13 years and the 14th year? Let me show you what I'm talking about. I shared this in the past in relation to Mary. Okay. We know Mary. Okay. You can see right here uh, from, uh, is that where I want to do? Let's see. Uh, yeah. From the age at which Jewish maidens became marriageable, it is possible that Mary gave birth to her son when she was about 13 or 14 years of age. Hello. This is ancient Israel, guys. We know the story. We know this story. I was thinking about sharing it again, but the time's getting late and I have a little bit more to share. We know the story. I've shared it in probably three or four different videos. It's a story about the marriage, right? The Galilean wedding type picture. But remember, this picture of the Galilean wedding has nothing to do with the pre-trib Luke, bride of Christ. It has nothing to do with her. The picture of an ancient Jewish wedding is like I had explained in videos, and this is what he talks about, but he goes in really elaborate into everything. 
that what happens? I have, I'm in ancient Israel. I'm 2,000 years ago or older. And I have a son, maybe he's three or four, and I see this little girl, she's maybe two, and she's a neighbor's. And she's so happy and pleasant. And I think, man, this would be a great bride for my daughter. Remember, it wasn't love, it was convenience in growing the family. And I go to my neighbor and I think, man, this is great. I, I, I see her, I go home, I prepare, the whole family prepares a huge dinner. And we go over the neighbor and we invite him over and have this big feast for a day or two. It can, he can go for a while. They'll sleep there even, right? Like he says, there was no clocks back then. We didn't have iPhones and watches everywhere. And they hang out. And then he says, hey, I have a great son. Your daughter is so happy and joyful. We should come together and make an agreement that when they become of age, they will marry. And so they have a scribe or somebody come and they either put it on leather or stone or hammer it out on metal. Two identical agreements, two identical contracts, two covenants perfectly in alignment. And when she becomes of age, guess what age it is? 13. When she's 13 years old, <clears throat> she comes of age. And at 13 years old, when she has come of age there is a legally binding wedding and they have this wedding celebration but they're not allowed to stay together yet he's going to go for one year to prepare a place and then he's going to return to receive her to himself. She knows he's going for about one year, essentially a year, but she doesn't know the day or hour when he's going to return. What's the picture? 13 years. There's a wedding at the end of 13 years. And then the 14th year when he returns, uh, when he's established the place after that final year, which is the end of 14 years. Do you know what these stories are, guys? Do you know what this is a picture of? This one here? Remember the, the Leia, right? The Leia one first? We've talked on this, right? It's the, it's the Luke chapter 14. This is why Mark has no wedding story in his. Luke's chapter 14, verse 7 has the parable of the wedding feast. This is, you know, sitting down in the lowest room. Don't go to the higher room. Sit down in the lowest room. Everybody going pre-trip. Don't go to the high room. Sit in the lowest room. This is the wedding feast of the pre-trib group. And this banquet isn't spoken of in Mark, isn't spoken of in Matthew, because this is the Luke 24 group this is the Luke chapter 12. Gird yourselves about when he returns from the wedding and I will come and sit and serve you. You guys all know that this is what it is. This one is directly related there in Luke 14 to the seven day wedding that's taking place in heaven. That's the banquet talked about in Luke 14, the, the wedding banquet and or the wedding feast and the banquet that comes after is when the Lord returns after the wedding and he's going to meet with the Smyrna Luke 24 workers of Luke who are going to be there with him for 40 days and then during seals. That is the relation to the story of the wedding feast and the banquet in Luke 14. We've shared on it a number of times. But now what are we looking at? We're looking at a wedding that takes place after 13 years, which we know after the six and one and then six, it's gonna end on the last day of the year, the end of Elul. And it's a what? Jewish wedding. So when do we know he's coming back after six days, which would be what? The very day one would be trumpets. 
either the first or the second of Tishri. Nobody knows which day it's going to fall on. It's either the first or the second. So they're going to get married, and then he's going to prepare a place for one year. So it's officially married, but then he's got to prepare a place, and then there's the whole big wedding ceremony celebration that takes place after the one year, the end of the 14th year. Okay? So there was none in Mark, but there was one in Luke. And another portion with the banquet, is there one in Matthew? Well, of course there is. In Matthew chapter 25, that most people don't realize is the continuation of Matthew 24. Matthew 25's discourse goes all the way through 25. Most people end in 24 because they don't understand it. So here's the coming of the Son of Man at the after six years of trumpets. At a day and hour, no one knows. And it relates to his coming. That is one remaining year, which is the picture of the story of as it was in the days of Noah. This days of Noah is this one year final year representation just as Hose, uh, Zechariah chapter 14 it's that same final one year so here he is being seen at a day and hour no one knows which is going to be the feast of trumpets there's that 13 years come to an end there's that everything is now official the lord has been here then you have the one year as the days of Noah. And when the one year is over, you follow the discourse and you have the kingdom of heaven. And what is it? Took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. 25 verse 1. Five were ready. Five weren't, right? It's all about having the oils in their lamps. Which, when you go and listen to this story, and we've shared on this before, it's the it's the it's the the bridesmaids nothing to do with the bride they are the bridesmaids they are the bridesmaids five of them had oil five didn't have oil right half are ready half are not ready and listen to what it said took their vessels why the while the bridegroom tarried they all slumbered and slept that night and at midnight there was a cry made behold the bridegroom cometh Go ye out to meet them. Five were ready, five weren't. Verse 10, Matthew 25, verse 10. And while they went out to buy, the bridegroom came, uh, and they that were ready went in with them to the marriage, and the door was shut. Then the others come, and it says, Watch ye therefore, for ye know neither the day or hour, right? Because we know then they couldn't come in. What is this? This is the wedding. This is the wedding story at the end of what? Him coming at the end. He fulfills that one year of, prep, of preparing, getting everything in order, destroying the enemy and everything else. And at the end of that final year, at the end of the 14th year, here he is coming. Here he is coming. The bridesmaids that were preparing, they were doing these things for one year. Half were ready, half weren't. It's 13. And then the 14th year. What was the story? 13 to 14 years. Watch this. I'll, I'll nail it home for you guys. Uh, let's see. Here it is. With the betrothal. Da, 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 da. So after the immersion, the couple entered. Okay, uh, the immersion. The bridegroom give the money, so forth. In this public ceremony, under the hoopah, the couple entered into the betrothal period, which typically lasted about one year. Although they were considered married, they did not live together or engage in sexual relations. 
you have the wedding, but it's, you got to wait the one year till the final preparations are over. Now, listen to this. During, uh, da, 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 during the Ursin, that's one of the three periods, the groom was to pair, prepare a place for his bride while the bride focused on her personal preparations, wedding garments, lamps, etc. You see, during that one year, they are preparing the bride. She was 13 years old. The wedding happens. They're officially married, but they can't be together. He goes to prepare a place and she's being prepared with her bridesmaids. Although the bride knew to expect her husband after about a year, she did not know the exact day or hour. Um, he could come earlier. It was the father of the groom who gave the final approval for him to return to collect his bride. For that reason, the bride kept her oil lamps ready at all times, just in case he came at the night. Listen to this. Sounding the shofar, the ram's horn, to lead the bridal procession to the home he had prepared for her. What didn't she know? She didn't know the day or hour. She didn't know the day or hour when he came at the end of that final 14th year. Which is a picture of what? The Feast of Trumpets, the blowing of the shofar on a day or hour they don't know. Everybody knows the idiom of the day and hour no one knows. It is the Feast of Trumpets because at the Feast of Trumpets it could be on the first or the second. And I'm going to show you the, the understanding of it. Which means if the end of the 14th year, so that final year was complete because he was gone for a year, but would return at a day or an hour he didn't that she didn't know, which is the Feast of Trumpets, what was the year before at the end of the 13th to start the 14th year? Just as Matthew 24 said, when the Lord comes at the end of the 6th to start the 7th, when six years as days are done, he's coming what? Just as Matthew 24 said, a day and hour no one knows. It's not that it's going to be some huge mystery. Because we know the revelation of the end of days is 14 years. It's 6-1-6-1. Six, one, six, one, final Jubilee. Who is going to be here for this wedding? Probably Israel, Judah. Remember those that that were taken into the wilderness for the final three and a half years of trumpets until he had destroyed Satan and, and restored everything and water went out from the temple and restored everything like Ezekiel 47 starts off with. And what happens after the restoring of the water that goes out everywhere? Then at the end of 47, you have Joseph through his two, do the, the two portions because of his sons. And then in Ezekiel 48, you've got starting with Dan and the rest of them each getting their portion. What is that? It's the beginning of the Jubilee and the restoration of all things. What do we have? Two distinct weddings. One before it all starts, the Gentile one, and one that is after 13 years. Then the place prepared for the final year and then the final celebration. And at the end of that final year, which is the end of the 14th year, what happens? Only the father knows. And there is a blast of a shofar on a day and hour that she didn't know but knew it was about some time within a year, about a year time frame. So let's look at this. Check this out. Okay. The Feast of Trumpets is the beginning of the Hebrew Jewish, year cal Jewish calendar. 
It is the only feast that begins on the new moon, which falls on Tishri first to second. Once the leaders, once the leaders knew what day the moon fell on, they could mark the beginning of the Feast of Trumpets as well as other feasts. However, because the children of Israel were scattered among the nations, isn't that exactly what's going to happen? They're going to start by being scattered among the nations. But what happens at the end of tribulation? During Satan's two and a half years, in the last three and a half years of trumpets, Satan's there and he will have scattered them abroad, remember? So if we go to Daniel chapter 12, I think verse 7, we've talked on it a number of times. See, for time, times and a half, that's two and a half of the final three and a half, when he shall have accomplished to a scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. When is this period of being finished? It's what we were talking about earlier, Revelation chapter 10. This is the end. That was the end of 13 years. What is the end of 13 years? It's the start of the voice. Revelation 10, 7. In the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God shall be finished. When is it? It's got to be the Feast of Trumpets. It starts on the Feast of Trumpets. It will then be the Feast of Trumpets on the day and hour when they see him coming at the end of six years or what? After six days. And then you have the one year. Then you've got the trumpet tribulation starting. You've got six years. And after those six years, what happens? There's a wedding. And it's a day and hour also that no one knows from Matthew, just like Mark's was. And the day and hour is related to the bride, which we can directly pinpoint to, which is immediately when the 14 years is over, it's the time of the Feast of Trumpets. And we could prove it by the wedding story of 13 years and one more year, which is the story of when the trumpet is sound to for the returning at a day and hour she knew not but only the father knew and he was the one that sounds that trumpet so if the end of 14 years is the feast of trumpets then the end of 13 is the feast of trumpets then the end of six from seals is the feast of trumpets and the reason for mark having nobody knows the day or hour when the lord is returning at the end of six years to start the seventh which is why matthew has the day and hour no one knows which is the end of six and one year remaining is the evidence that it's the feast of trumpets after six of seals it is the feast of trumpets after six of trumpets or after 13 years and it's the feast of trumpets when that one year is complete by the evidence of the wedding of the shofar blast at the day and hour no one knows Listen to this. Once the leaders knew that the new moon fell, they could begin the uh, Feast of Trumpets as well as the other feasts. However, because the children of Israel were scattered among the nations after the destruction of Jerusalem in 586 BC, the only way they can communicate with each other and observe the Feast of Trumpets was by lighting fires on mountaintops in order to signal the, uh, the feast had begun. However, by the time they were able to spread the word and observe the Feast of Trumpets, the day was over. So the Feast of Trumpets was observed for two days, Tishri 1 and 2, to ensure that all the children of Israel could observe it as commanded by God in Leviticus 23. In Judaism, it, in Judaism, it is known as the feast where no one knew the day or hour it came because of the diaspora and the time it took, the light, uh, to light the fires on the mountaintops across the land. There was a wise saying that if Satan would have known the day and hour of the Feast of, Trump the D Feast of Trumpets fell on, then he would not have wanted to crucify the, our Lord to be crucified because this means his time is drawing nigh. Another tradition and customary terminology used by the children of Israel related to a Jewish wedding. Hello. In Jesus' day, weddings were arranged, so when someone would ask the son to date, uh, the date of his wedding day, the son would say, only my father knows. Let us remember, Jesus Yeshua was a Jew and spake Aramaic Hebrew, 
when he spake using the traditions and customary terminology, the children of Israel would have understood the reference point, which in this case is the Feast of Trumpets. The day and hour that no one knew except the Father, because it was the Father that gave the final approval. And when it was come, the shofar blast was made and guess what happens in matthew chapter 25 at the end of the 14th year there's the blast and the bridegroom comes which means what which means that the day and hour like i just said at the day and hour of the end of the 13th year to start the 14th is the Feast of Trumpets, which is clearly like the Transfiguration of Matthew. When we go to Mark's and we see he has a day and hour, <laughs> we know it's the Feast of Trumpets when six are complete of seals and he starts the seventh year. We have biblical evidence of after six being the Feast of Trumpets beginning the seventh year of seals. We have biblical evidence at the end of the sixth year or of trumpets uh, or 13 years of tribulation. He's coming at the feast of trumpets. And we have at the end of the 13th, then to the 14th year, the final picture of the wedding, which is after the year of the story of Noah going to Matthew 25. That tells us that the end of the 14th year, that one year, He's returning at the Feast of Trumpets, the day and hour no one knows. What do you think it means if at the end of six, at the end of six, and at the end of that final 14th, they're all telling us the Feast of Trumpets? What on earth do you think that means the 14 years begins on? Get excited, brothers and sisters, because it means the tribulation will begin on the Feast of Trumpets, just as we've been revealing, which is precisely from the count of Taurus in the beginning to the true Feast of Weeks, which will then begin the 50 days and everything we have broken down about it. And it takes us to the last day of the year and the anointing of the Holy Ghost on the disciples, and then the attack to start the 14 years at the Red Horse Rider on the Feast of Trumpets. We had already proven the revelation of it beginning at Trumpets by the fifth and seventh month revelation of Zechariah chapter 7 for years. Now we can prove the day and hour after six years of seals, the day and hour after 13 years or the sixth year of trumpets, and the day and hour when he returns for the final wedding at the end of the 14th year or after the 14th year, he is coming at trumpets in all three of those cases, which means the revelation of it all starting the 14 years at the Feast of Trumpets is also true. Do you get it? Do you understand now how powerful this all is? How it can't be off by a year and why that is so important that it cannot be off by a year? In, in the year, and, and in the recent months that we also got the revelation of Jesus and him coming as a child born unto us, being related to two months off. And every single piece of it was related from here to here. Brothers and sisters. I don't know what more I can tell you, <clears throat> except this is it. So what did we just see? 
I'm going to finish it up with this. We know the big picture is 21 years. We got the picture through Jacob with Leah and Rachel and so forth. We got the picture in the story of creation in the typologies. And we know the final Jubilee is the 22nd year in the big picture. It's the 15th year after in, in seals and trumpets during tribulation time. To the Jews, it's the eighth year, like the eighth day of tabernacles. Now do you get it? Their first seven, but it relates to only one day, which is the Feast of Weeks, pre-trib escape, seven days as years of unleavened bread. Then the third Feast of the Lord, seven days as years of tabernacles and then what's the eighth day of tabernacles it's the same as the 15th in the picture of seals unleavened bread and trumpets as tabernacles and the final eighth day so what is it it's like the eighth day new beginning in the in the picture of tribulation of seals and trumpets it's the 15th year which is the final jubilee and the new beginning. And in the big picture of the overall, it's the 22nd year and new beginning. Watch this. Let me finish it off with this. Okay. Okay, we covered that. We covered that. Let me show for those that are newer. When you, when you hear things like, those seven days of creation would have been like 7,000 to us if we were there in time. And the 7,000 years that we're in right now from the flesh in time to the Lord, they're only seven days. The understanding of that is found in 2 Peter 3, 8. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord. Okay, like in the creation, they were days, right? In, in the seven days of creation, those were days. One day with the Lord. So one of those days with the Lord is a thousand years. So if we were there in time, it would have been like a thousand years. So we can count it like it was a thousand years long. But to him, it's like a day. So that means those seven days of that portion of creation, they were one day, one day, one day. There were seven of them. But to us, he's telling us right here that each of them would have been as a thousand, which means it was 7,000. And then you have comma and. So it's not telling you the same thing. It's a separation and they could be added together. So there was 7,000 as days, and then there's, or there were seven days of 7,000. And then he says, what? A thousand is as a day. Well, the thousands began at Adam. We're in the thousands, and it will be 7,000 will end at the end of the millennial reign. To us, there are thousands in the flesh in the dimension of time, but to the Lord, they're still as days. So what is this telling us right here? This is telling you that the creation of the days would have been to us 7,000, but to the, God, the Lord God, they were days, which they were, because we weren't there in the creation of the flesh and time. And now we're living in 7,000s in the creation of flesh and time, but to the Father, there's still days. So what is that saying? To the Father, it was seven days and seven days. To us, it would have been 7,000 years and 7,000 years. That's what? That's the same picture of the end of days, seven years and seven years. It's all a fractal. We've shared on this before, right? Well, let's not forget. This is why I was bringing it up at the beginning. This whole piece in Genesis chapter one, verse one and two, called the gap theory by theologians and, and others, they think it explains millions or billions of years. No, it's the first 7,000. It's the story of Jacob, the first seven that were seven that to the father, they would have been as days and to us in that dimension, they would have seemed as thousands. But the Lord was so excited as the typology of Jacob, they flew by like days. So all we get is a picture of two verses. And what do we get in a picture of the end of days? We get a picture called above 14 years. So it's not telling us the whole story of everything happening during these first seven years, which is a part of the picture of the end of days. 
but it's telling us the main piece is the portion called above 14 years, which is the 50 days. Hello. Which is the 50 days. But hidden within it is the revelation that it was seven days to the Father, but also a typology of 7,000 to us. How do we know this? Because the entire picture everywhere is all about 22 years, 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. Uh, 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 seven easy, seven then of Rachel, six of Leah, then a covenant, that final year. Then what are the most, what is the key of all of this in the interpretation of, of its typology in the, in, the, in the end of days? All this stuff is nothing told to us. The key of the end of days is to understand what's coming during the tribulation and a small portion above the 14 years of tribulation. This is the focus. And what was the focus in 2 Peter 3, 8? Seven as days for thousands and 7,000 as years for days to the Lord. This Mark group who he's coming to save is, of course, we know the group that are the lost sheep of the house of Israel who he came to save. This is the group that needs saving the great multitude. And this is the other group, excuse me, is the other group which relates to the priestly line and, and, and the sheep, uh, 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 sorry, and Judah and so forth. This is why Peter is telling us about two portions of seven. You get it in the story of Jacob, and you can find it in other places in these little mysteries. But the real focus that, that is obvious throughout everything is the seven and seven, the 14 years. And this piece that's called above is the mystery that comes out of the first seven. You ever wonder why you see it like casinos and all these things? Everybody, it's like lucky seven and they say seven, seven, seven. You know, you see it in all sorts of things. Everything has a story to it. It is 21,000 years. To the father, it would be 21 days. Could you imagine? Soon that's what it'll be like to us. But to us, it would have felt like 21,000 years because in the reality of time, it was 21,000 years. So what does that make the 22nd thousand? It's the same picture as the beginning of the 15th year or the 21st year, 21st year after tribulation. It's the, it's the beginning of the millennial reign, but in the year count, it's what? It's the eighth day of tabernacles. It's the 15th or 22nd, and it relates to the eighth day of tabernacles, which is the new beginning. What does it relate to the end of days? In the big picture, in the big picture, with these all being thousands, 1,000, 7,000 is done. 7,000 is done, 7,000 is done, right? So what does this relate to in the big picture of days? Not this year, right? But this begins what? This begins the millennial reign. What is the millennial reign? It's the final seven in the big picture. It's the end of 6,000, right? Whoops. It's the end of the 6,000 years. Here's our fractal count picture, right? Here's a picture of the 21 years and 22nd, all this stuff we were talking about. And it's the very end before the 6,000 years of the time that we're in, in this triangle depicted right here. But in the big, uh, the big fractal picture, the whole story is actually 21,000 years. Okay, seven to the Lord, seven to the Lord, seven to the Lord. But like 7,000 to us, 7,000 to us, and the actual 7,000 we're living in. You add them all together, there's your millennial reign. The 21st thousandth year is the same as the seven from Adam, the 7,000th year. That's the final millennial reign. What happens at the end 
of the millennial reign. Well, surely there can't be a wedding. We already had the Gentile wedding here depicted in Luke's disc in, in Luke's gospel. We already had the Matthew wedding at the end of this seventh year depicted in the gospel uh, sorry, the first one depicted in the gospel of Luke with the wedding and then him having that meal with those workers. Right? With the seal Luke guys. And we saw in Matthew at the end of the 14th year the wedding happening for this group. So we had one wedding here. We had one wedding here. How on earth or why on earth would there be a wedding at the end of the millennial reign? Let's have a look. It's pretty wild. Okay, watch this. Let's go to Revelation 21 and bring this to an end. What happened in Revelation? Let's go to Revelation 20 to start. In Revelation 20, what do we see? The thousand years, Satan's bound. Right? The seals workers from Luke. Remember the seals workers, the Smyrna group? They're a very special group, guys. They are not foundation layers. They are not the wall builders. They are not the gates. Okay? They're a separate group, and this is them right here. They're going to be the ones resurrected to rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years. We've taught on it many times. These are the ones who will not be hurt by the second death, just as we read in Smyrna. But the one group I don't talk about very much, which is the apostle group, they're connected to John. That apostle group is going to receive the Holy Ghost on the very beginning of day 50. After the escape, they're going to receive the Holy Ghost. They're the apostles. They relate to Ephesus. Okay, they're the first church at the beginning of 50 days. That is, that is the apostles. The apostles' responsibility is laying the spiritual foundation during seals while during seals a physical foundation is being laid. The 144,000 are the ones responsible for the spiritual walls of Jerusalem being built while the first half of trumpets, the actual walls are being built. You following? So, the, the, the apostles during seals who are also here at the same time as the Smyrna disciples, the Smyrna disciples aren't responsible for laying the physical foundation, which is going to be done by the modern day Zerubbabel and those that are brought back to do it in, in the land. But there are the apostles who are responsible during seals to build up a spiritual foundation in the Lord. I've taught on this over the years. The 144,000 who are here during trumpets are the picture of the spiritual walls of Jerusalem being built while during the time of trumpets, the actual walls are being rebuilt along with the city and the temple. And as we saw at the end of Matthew, the end of Matthew relates, as we saw in the discourse also, to the 12 tribes. And it is the tribes who are responsible during the millennial reign. Remember I told you the three watches? You had the, the Luke group that aren't foundation. They're not related to these things. Theirs is to bring in the harvest. The, the Mark group that relates to 144 at the end of seals, theirs is to build the spiritual walls. They're the 144,000. They relate to the walls. The end of Matthew, who is the third watch. So the Mark group is the second watch, the 144. The third watch is the 12 tribes, and their responsibility is going out during the millennial reign, which is why at the end of Matthew 28, the Lord said he's now with you till the end of the world, and they're going out to teach, which is exactly what you read about them going to teach in uh, Zechariah 14. 
So we know that while there are physical things taking place on the earth, there are spiritual things being built during this time as well, for which the apostles during seals are building spiritual Jerusalem, the, the spiritual foundation. During trumpets, the 144 are building the spiritual walls of Jerusalem. And during the millennial reign, the, 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 the 12 tribes are building the spiritual gates while there are gates through which people are going to enter, which represent the 12 tribes who are going out and teaching during the, the millennial reign through which these people will enter to come and praise the Lord. But the first watch group who were privileged, who were, who were chosen by the Lord to dine with him at a special banquet are a group that we read about in Revelation chapter 20 who are the ones of the Luke group who are going to be resurrected to rule and reign with them during the millennial reign who are directly related to everything we've been teaching of the Luke 24 workers as the Smyrna group. These guys we know are not related to foundations, walls, or gates being spiritually built up. Theirs is a different work, which is what has been being revealed and taught and prepared here. And this is their portion of their reward. But look what happens in 21 of Revelation at the end of the millennial reign. Revelation 21.1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Now, when is this? In the picture of these being thousands of sevens, 7,000, 7,000, 7,000, where are we? We're at the end of the thousand, seven thousandth year of the flesh of Adam. But we're also in the big picture at the end of the 21,000th year, and also according to um, uh, 2 Peter 3, 8, we're at the end of the 7,000 and 7,000 right here as well. So you see, it's all throughout scripture. It's everywhere, which means we're at what? At the end of the millennial reign, we are at the beginning of the big picture fractal of the 22nd thousandth year. If the 22nd year was a picture of tabernacles and the eighth day was the new beginning, and it was seven and seven and the 15th was a picture of the new beginning, and the 777 and the 22nd is the picture of the new beginning in relation to tribulation, what do you think it means at the end of 7,000, 7,000, and 7,000. It means new beginning. What happens at this new beginning? I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, come down from God out of heaven, prepared and adorned as a bride. What is prepared and adorned as a bride? You? Me? Israelites? Or is it New Jerusalem? Remember, who's building the spiritual New Jerusalem up? Oh, sure, it's filled with the people, but the picture is the city itself that is adorned as a bride for her husband. Is now God is going to tabernacle with men. There will be no more tears. Uh, there will be no more death, no more pain. 
in verse 5, and he sat on the throne, and behold, I will make all things, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write these words, he uh, uh for these words are faithful and true. And he says in verse 6, and he said unto me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Who's the beginning and the end? Of course, Christ is, right? And the end is what? The beginning. And the beginning is found in the end. And the end in the beginning. He is the beginning and the end. Craziness. He that overcometh shall inherit. Now listen to this in verse 9. Uh, he that had the vials uh, halfway through. Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in spirit into a great and high mountain and showed me that great city the holy Jerusalem descending out of heaven from God. Having the glory of God and her light was like unto a light of stone, most precious, even like jasper stone, clear as crystal. Listen to what it said. It had walls, gates, and foundations. All right. Let's look at verse 14. Um, and the wall of the city had 12 foundations. And in them the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Verse 17, And he measured the wall thereof, 144, you see, cubits according to the measure of a man, that is, of the angel. 144, 144,000. Okay? They are the walls that are built, of course, after the foundation is laid. And what about the 12 gates? Revelation 21, 21. And the 12 gates were the 12 uh, pearls of Almighty God. And let's go up here to where you see the 12 gates. Uh, verse 12. So Revelation 21, 12. Uh, and had a wall great and high and had 12 gates. And at the gates, 12 angels, the names written thereon, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. Told you. There are three weddings. There's the Gentile bride, there's the Jewish bride, and then at the end of the millennial reign, which is a picture of the 13,000th and then the 14,000th, which is still also a picture of the 21,000th and then the beginning of the 27th or uh, the 22nd thousand, that final wedding is New Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven, adorned as a bride. And you want to see that it is the city? Check this out. I caught this about a month ago. Let's finish with this. Isaiah 62, verse 1. For Zion's sake will I not hold my peace, and for Jerusalem's sake, comma, and, for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest, until the righteous thereof go forth as brightness, and the salvation thereof as a lamp that burneth. And the Gentiles shall see the righteousness and all the kings thy glory. And thou shalt be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord Father shall name. Thou shalt also, uh, thou shalt also be a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord, and a royal diadem in the hand of thy God. Listen to this. Verse 4 and 5. Thou shalt no more be termed forsaken. Neither shall thy land any more be termed desolate. When does that happen? Right? At the end of 70 for Jerusalem? At the end of the 14 years? At the, at the end of the big picture also of the millennial reign? But thou shall be called, whatever this name is, Keftzibah, okay? Which means my delight, comma, and thy land is going to be called married. To be married. And thy land is going to be called married. 
for the Lord delights in thee, listen to this, and thy land shall be married. For as a young man marrieth a virgin, so shall thy sons marry thee. And as the bridegroom rejoiceth over his bride, so shall God rejoice over thee. Brothers and sisters, there are three weddings. There are three weddings. The first revealed in Luke to the Gentile bride. The second revealed at the end of trumpets, at the end of the 14th year, revealed in Matthew for the Jewish bride, for the, 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 the Hebrew bride. And at the end of the millennial reign, there is one more bride, and she is the land. She is New Jerusalem coming down from the new, with the new heaven and the new earth. Brothers and sisters, I told you this was going to be a wild trip. We are here. This is the 70th. It cannot be one more year. There is a wedding coming. There is a wedding ending. And at the end of the millennial reign, at the end of the 21,000 to the 22,000, is another picture just like this one of the Lord's final wedding, which is that bride prepared for him, that land, that new Jerusalem coming down from him. Brothers and sisters, it is all here. It is on like Donkey Kong, man. I'm telling you. Show me. If I have misunderstood something here, please help me to understand. Share it in the forum. Send me a private message. Email me. You can find it in the description box under the videos. Post a comment under the video. Help me to understand what's been missed when the Spirit himself revealed the revelation of right on target that Taurus was the beginning and is the beginning to the Lord God. Show me how it's possible that the wheat is actually ready for the harvest late July to the very beginning of August. Show me how it's wrong that new wine is actually ready in middish September. Show me how the 50 days from the 5th and the 7th isn't possible when it's written in Scripture. Show me the understanding of no one knows the day or hour not being to tabernacles the day and hour no one knows but only the Father. How is it not connected to after six and after six for seals and trumpets? When at the end of 14, which is the following year, it's the sound of the shofar at the day and hour no one knows but the Father. And Mark and Matthews both have it. But Luke's does not. Brothers and sisters, this was a gangbuster video. This covered the revelation of it to show this is where we are to show this final count to have understood that it goes to tishri for judah to have counted it from leviticus to have counted it from christ's birth from his death and resurrection from when he began to be 30 from when they came into the land from 14 years remaining between the two 70s to show that it must be when 70 is done and day one following is the beginning of 71, before the 71st year is complete. All of it is in order, guys. I am so grateful. I am so just beside myself that we have been so blessed to receive the revelation. I feel like you guys, and, and times 10. Because it's been happening through me and I, I don't have a reason. I don't have an explanation. I have no idea why. But there's one thing I do know. It absolutely, unequivocally, 100% has been revealing itself through this ministry. With each of you having your part in it as well. 
in sharing with us, in sharing with each other, sharing it with others. We are having an effect. We are preparing a people for either that wedding in the third heaven in the lowest room or to be prepared prayerfully as that portion that will not taste of death because we are the ones he has given the revelation of whoever finds the beginning finds the end for in the beginning there will the end be i love you guys god bless you god bless your families we will see you very soon and don't forget tomorrow 6 to 7 p.m mountain standard time we will be i will be with them on tribulation now sharing the insights and the revelation of pre mid and post revealed in the gospels i love you guys god bless you god bless your families we'll talk to you soon bye for now